thinkers, a person who really, in many instances, is a spotlight to us in our quest for liberation because he has gone all up into the corporate suites, all into the bowels of the secret societies as an invisible man. He'd been there and nobody even knew he was there collecting information in dangerous places. One of the greatest uh, espionage agents of all time who has come back from his last journey up into the suites of Time Warner and the suites of the News Corporation to report to us live and in person what we are about to face. And that's none other than our friend all the way from Chicago, Illinois, currently residing in Maryland. Let's give it up. Let us all stand and give a warm round of applause to our brother, our comrade, our agent, our intelligence apparatus, Steve Coakley. Steve Coakley. All right, don't kiss Carol Taylor too tight now. I saw that. Come on up on stage, Steve. This ain't Valentine. Don't get deterred. Let's give it up one more time. Who needs no introduction, simply a presentation. Our brother, our comrade, our friend, brother, brother. Stop hugging these sisters, brother. Let's take down the business. Steve. Steve Coakley, give it up one more time. Steve Coakley. All right. I really appreciate you, brother. <laughs> Finally, I get my turn. All right. All right. All right, thanks. Where's that bag at? Good evening. Hotel. All right. Uh, let's see here. There we go. All right. How you Africans doing? Boy, it's been quite a week. Whoa. Yeah, that's right. War. <laughs> Not war, war. I, I uh, humbly uh, appreciate uh, having this opportunity to talk uh, with you Africans here uh, in New York. Uh, last time I was here, uh, I very profoundly said uh, and gave great respect to this forum, uh, not only of you uh, as an organization, but this as a platform and uh, these brothers as leadership. And I'm uh, really humbled uh, to have been a benefactor of your ability to organize. And in fact, I think you got a better peek at the fact that under certain circumstances, the enemy is excessively threatened of even these mere conversations. I couldn't tell you or express to you uh, the gratitude I have for uh, Brother Alton Maddox, who has uh, been my godfather the last week or two. He's a... But to tell you honestly, that level of applause would never fill a half of what the brother has done over the last 10 days to two weeks, not to belittle anything he's ever done, but you would never be able to appropriately appreciate the strength that this brother has behind the curtain. You see, yeah, that's two times you have failed to m appropriately respond to what I'm trying to tell you, some of, uh, of which I can't even tell you, about what this brother has done 
behind the scenes in your behalf in managing this issue in a way that straight up you finally got a peek at what whites really think about the little piddly insignificant things that we share together and this brother unbeknownst to most of you will never maybe you will on the third time feel appropriately a reflection for the strength the never wavering counsel and the spirit of brother Art Maddox from this week Time Warner, Gerald Levin, Rupert Murdoch, and Abraham Foxman have been intimately involved in calculating the slave theater. Now, I want you to understand that we've been able to get in the back channel of some of that dialogue, and they said on Tuesday night, I ask goes down. And they'd rather try to worm and squirm. Maybe they might have Black History Month in Asia, or Taiwan, or Singapore, or Hong Kong, or Yugoslavia. Maybe they'll have it in Bosnia. That'll be about the only places they can go that they could have it without us. But you got to peek at some things this week, and I don't ever want you to underestimate the fact that some of the most powerful white men in the world unilaterally got together and decided that they would tell African people who they can have for their empowering Black History Month program. And when they said our roots run deep, they meant hunky roots run deep into the black community. That's what they said. And so every now and then, the white man stick that thermometer up your butt just to get a peek and see how much of this you can tolerate. I was the benefactor of a lot of built up shit in your life. Because so much had happened prior to this, I became a benefactor of a group of people that said, no, nah, we ain't going back another step. I became a benefactor of that, a, a benefactor. And I'm humble that I was in that position to be that brother around these other brothers and sisters that had uh, got heavily tested uh, by some of the biggest and strongest elements of the enemy. Oh, 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 oh. Now, there's so much about this we got to get into. And there's so much about this I got to show you uh, that um, I'm going to do my best. I tell you, since I talked to these brothers, I've been talking to Brother Maddox and uh, Brother Sharpton and uh, Brother Conrad and some people who are nameless who we can't name and, and many people over these last uh, 10 days to two weeks, I don't think I ever spent as much time on the telephone. In fact, I hate to see this phone bill when it comes, because we be doing three and four and 10-way calls and shit, and I know this ain't in my bankroll. I'm, I'm in the league with some of these heavy hitters, and my bankroll just don't hold up on this big time level. So me and Maddox, we be, we the, we the junior finance people in this operation. We around these heavy-weighted financial people. We hanging the best we can. Maddox's phone broke down on him yesterday. It was so hot. He had to run out and get a new phone. I done melted the receiver. You know how you talk on the phone so long and get the stinking on the front? <laughs> now, I tell you honestly, the phone is yeah, talking and shouting and spitting. There's so many people uh, that I need to thank. Uh, those brothers and sisters who signed that letter that went to Time Warner, to Chairman Gerald Levin, uh, I'm most appreciative of them. And I have the letter down here. I'm going to pull it out. Now, hold it now. And I'm going to tell y'all something. I'm going to tell y'all some shit right up front. We've been fighting real hard. Don't y'all fuck it up tonight. Now, I'm going to tell y'all. Now, see, you don't understand this. 
We're in one long whip of making a point to the hunky. In fact, I thought I'd sing y'all a song tonight. I feel a little stupid doing this because I ain't a singer, but we'll get to that a little later. But I'm telling you this. We fought real hard to get to this spot tonight, and we ain't going to let y'all mess it up. Now, we appreciate you being here. And God, I appreciate all of you that chose to back up the organization that's backing up me, that's backing up brothers and sisters, that's bringing forth a movement. And they're here tonight. They are up in here tonight, and they want to know if you really understand what went on. Do you understand that a major corporation, this is the largest communication company in the world, got their face slapped All right. All right. hard to the point that they are gonna pick up their shit and walk someplace else with it or walk no place with it rather than to give it to us for a couple of hours. They'll give you the money. They'll give you anything but the opportunity to talk to some people that definitely needed what we had to offer. That was the worst part about it. The hunky knew that we was deep in that plantation and he didn't want no freedom thinking. So it's one of them old uh, Kunta Kente Toby things, you know? And people were being told, even though it was Black History Month, they had to think corporate. And they looked out there and found who was corporate friendly and who wasn't. They looked up and called people out of the woodwork. I seen one man, they say, man, this man showed up, he worked for Murdoch. Oh, I shouldn't say work for Murdoch. He's influenced by Murdoch money. He stood up for Murdoch money, but he drifted in on our issue a little bit. Want to scout us out, feel us up. Say, yeah, we real mad. Go tell him that. And it was very important for me. In fact, I heard it on Bob Law Show last week when I was on for just a minute. That people try to look over at the New York Post and think right-wing, crazy, white, be belittling, trashy newspaper. But that's not what the Post is at all. That's Murdoch's entree into the United States of America. All right. That's Murdoch breaking down the boundaries that separate corporations. Right. That's not about the Post. And again, like Maddox said earlier, remember, he got his spot through death. Levin got his spot through death. So don't get up here and mistake this thing and let somebody get killed because you didn't quite know what your job was when your turn came. All right, that's it. All right. I don't want you to miss this because this is some serious shit right now. All right. No, I mean, I'm telling you now, this is some serious stuff. The people we talking about killed presidents. When I start telling you about Henry Luce, who formed Time Magazine, go back there and ask Dick Gregory. In fact, do we hear from Dick Gregory yet? Anybody hear from Dick Gregory yet? <laughs> Now, I, I, I was walking around Manhattan, I saw his picture up on the theater. He's over there. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go over there. <laughs> in fact, you heard them say they couldn't wait to hear from him. But Dick Gregory, when I was in college, used to go around and show this little film of the Kennedy assassination because Time Magazine bought the Zabruder film. Right, right. And for 15 years, Time Magazine manipulated those frames with Gay Edgar Hoover. And so Dick Gregory used to have to take them and hold the pictures in his hand and flip them like a deck of cards, and you would see the head go back violently. All right. But that's not the way they started. They didn't start that way. When, when Dan Rather saw that film, he said it went violently front. And that's how he got on the evening news. Right. But he, Claire Luce Booth and, 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 and Henry Luce were vicious whites. They killed to make a time empire. They killed to make that happen. So we understand, we didn't call a fish, we didn't call a killer fish. But the killer fish is afraid in his own water. How long has Manhattan gone unmolested, Africans? How long has Manhattan gone unmolested? A long time. And the point of that is that downtown don't much heat drift deep into the bowels of corporate downtown. The word is you can do good business in New York. Uh, I got a tape back there, the riot report. I remember when the Rodney King thing came down, I have found that article how the white people in Manhattan broke their legs and hurt their heads and got stitches running out of here when they heard you was coming downtown. You never made it, but they ran thinking you was coming. I never forgot that. 
You go back there and listen back to your own story. We not the World Trade Center bomber people. That makes us much more difficult to deal with. We not adjective throwers. We ain't in this jam because we out here slinging adjectives. You do understand the difference. How often have we sat here and talked about why we're belittled in our own community and we look up and see the white man ain't missed a step of it. He know more about the danger of what we're doing than we do. And humbly as being a very disrespected brother, and I always felt disrespect was an, was an advantage, underestimation was an advantage. A uh, little heads up peak, we got a good idea of that. They ain't sleeping post-million man march. When the white man saw two million black people get together for a dubious, for a dubious idea as atonement, what would have happened if we had been offended? You understand that? The intelligence community reevaluates everybody's perspectives. The potential of the slave is greater with two million men in the background. Brother Coakley's hooligan little ragtag, raggedy ass information outlet is a little bit more dangerous than two million men for the subject of atonement. This is a monumental thing going on in the black community. People who are speaking who don't speak. People who are tolerating each other's differences who don't normally have that level of patience. People pressing other people to do right and people responding accordingly. Strong options. So last week when we were talking about Murdoch, we wanted to keep emphasizing that Murdoch is as legitimate as Time Warner, Newsweek, the White House, or any of the rest of them. He's as vicious as any of the rest of them. But that New York Post, again, I remind you, is the same person that puts out NFL football. He's the same guy that bring you 90210 and Martin. He's the same guy. And Martin, I have never seen one of his shows that ever had any socially redeeming value, brother. I know y'all are on the media, but I have never seen one show have a socially redeeming value. But I remember when James Earl Jones had that little show about the family and stuff that was really deep. That shit didn't last four episodes. It didn't. I don't even know the name of it. But it was really heavy. It had some deep interactions between Africans in it. Uh, and they killed it because it wasn't appropriate. It wasn't media appropriate. When we go look a little at Jack Warner, who formed the other side of that corporation on Time Warner, talk about he spent much of his career in blackface. Making nigger jive a vaudeville act. And after he did nigger jive, he ended up opening up some studios and stuff. Right. Anyway, I remember the night we talk, we're going to talk about him. I remember the night I got fired. And yeah, this is it, Baba. This is what they're afraid of. That's what I wanted to tell you. This is it. This is all it is. I don't, it's a little heavy. But this is it, all. this is all I got, brother. This is my whole life is right on these folders here. And I was lucky to get the folders. I didn't want to embarrass myself. I went and got a pair of pants and, and, and got some clean folders and stuff. But this is what it's all about. It ain't no more than this. And that little garbage on the back of that table and the feelings we share as brothers and sisters. The, there you go, Baba. That's right. That's right. And, and, and did we not say that they took that X away from us and then gave it to our FBI UFO program. That, that's just a whole nother. We'll get that back too. But that's Fox. And I want you all to go look up the word Fox in a dictionary of symbols. Look up the word Fox. You will see it's equated with devil. So then we got a Fox man and a, and a Fox. Anyway. You might want to carry the mic. Yeah, let me get it together. Yeah, let me open these up. I got a lot of stuff here to spread out. Well, you all, we got a lot to talk about. Boy, it's a lot going on up in here. We had a lot of interesting things happen this week. I can't wait to tell you all, all of this stuff. I need to, again, uh, 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 to thank uh, both, uh, both publicly, uh, Brother uh, McIntosh and Sister Camille, for the support that they provided us this week as well. Very significant. I appreciate both of you all. And I appreciate the two brothers who couldn't be here with us tonight, uh, Reverend Sharpton and uh, Brother Conrad Muhammad. I know they will be here. 
Uh, tomorrow night, did Brother Conrad's representative come? Okay, Brother Conrad had said he'd have a representative here tonight to represent his viewpoint. And I know he has one. So we would, uh, if he is here or does come, uh, we had offered to share the platform with his representative. And so uh, uh, we want to make that available and in the public too. Uh, now, boy, let me see here. I got one file named Time, one file named Warner, one file named uh, The New Establishment. Uh, oh, we got the Board of Directors of Time Warner. Uh, let's see here. Where are we going to start at? Let's go here. Let's start here at an interesting little spot. Let's see what we got here. Oh, I'm going to do my best. Y'all got to let me break it on down to you. Name the names, brother. Now, you can't see this too good. We're going to get this together. Let me see. I might need to lift this up a little. Okay. Hold on. I just want to get, let me do this now. Hold on. For the camera, I want to put the name which is at the bottom. Now, this is shaking a little bit. I don't know what's making it vibrate. Uh, we talk every time I'm here. Brother been here quite a while. He's quite a survivor. Um, uh, I never met this lady, but I hear she had something to do with what was going on, Brother Maddox. Her name is Tony Faye. She's the Vice Corporate Community Relations Person of Time One. I put that up there just a little higher. So you can see the name over there. You got now, I talk. Anyway, I ain't going to do it. I'm going to go on with it. Okay. Y'all see the name? Y'all see? What's the name? What's her name? Face. What is her name? Face. All right, remember the face. This is a profile of her that appeared in essence about black power. I thought I'd start here. Black power. White power is and can be very threatening. Black power, in lieu of all of the de deficits and circumstances we've been put in, has to be triply as strong. Therefore, black power, straight up with white power, is black victory. That's, why we, that's what happened. We finally got to go heads up with them, and we were able to push for victory because they do not go heads up with nobody. But this is an expose about black power. Now, there were 10 black women in this. Now, I think I'm going to have to start calling other nine because I hope they ain't as weak as this sister. This sister on the other side of the page, now I didn't get to bring that page, but on the other side of that page, going down that little strip over there, she's telling Essence Magazine how conscious she is of the black community. How she set up their community relations division in 1982. And how she's really concerned about how the people think about Time Warner in the black community and how interested she is in helping it. All right. That's what she said to Essence. The reality is, is that the sister betrayed us. She took it upon herself to cushion and save the white man, Gerald Levin, from having to meet with a group of black men who challenged him for responding to an accusation of ours. If we were in a court of law, and God, I don't even believe in court, because I got things they owe me for what didn't happen that I can't go to court to get because I don't appeal to no court. You all know I don't believe in it. I'm not going to go to it. I might even be wrong by it. I'll get my remedy through other mechanisms. Okay. But this sister took it upon herself to shield that white man. She did some very frightening things to black people over the last couple of days. And I wanted to be clear that you might be somewhere across Manhattan, you might be uh, in some studio, you might be at a nice reception or a book signing and you might see that face. And I want you to take the black off of that power. Because you see, she, in fact, is the works for the time Warner mothership. You know they always have the head of Negro relations. She always has that. And, as, and they always have one of them as head of Negro relations. She got out there on her own. 
and tried to do some damage to the little African Black History Month. In fact, this lady said some things to some people that were pretty frightening in consideration of what her role and job is. You might need to call Time Warner tomorrow and ask to speak to her and ask her, can you equate black power with her performance over the Black History Month program? Now, you know how belittling it is to be assigned some black history activity. It's belittling. I don't even like, when they call me, I don't even like to call it that because it just is belittling. Because for one to grant you history is slavery. That's belittling. But this sister took it upon herself last Thursday night to try to force someone on the stage to announce I was being canceled. And that was not only not a good thing to do, but deep in the person's heart, it wasn't the right thing to do, and they wouldn't do it. And they told her to go out there and do it, and she said, I can't do that. She brushed up on Reverend Sharpton. Asked Reverend Sharpton, would Coakley meet or talk with me? No! Coakley held the line, we will meet with no black person who had nothing to do with no decision to be fetched out to us like nigger shit. We wouldn't take it, and you need to know the reason we're in this spot now was that we asked for the hunky, we went for the hunky, and nothing less than the hunky would do. She tried to put pressure on Susan Taylor. Susan Taylor, Reverend Maddox, Brother Maddox, I feel like he reverend sometimes, boy, I swear to God. Uh, Brother Maddox and uh, Brother Sharpton and Sister Taylor called me yesterday. This is very important that that sister wanted to make clear that she stood with us. You heard the brothers mention it on the radio yesterday, that she would not cross the line against me and the other brothers in the program. <clears throat> and you don't know how easy it would have been to blow past me in those earlier moments and I know you felt it brother it looked like the word was out but my word wasn't in it and when it really got down to it the only non-compromising position in the crowd was absolutely not him now we might work something but not this one never period and the smoke out was if I could have just been left back in the sand somewhere because it was known you could, you, you could be black and play past Coakley, belittling him and disrespecting him and go on past him. I mean, we got leadership summits and we got all kind of stuff we ain't never at. And, and we didn't go on some deeper than most. But we ain't never at the things when we act together to make the best thing come forward because we're not considered those type of people. When we were together on the Black Holocaust program, we were repudiated by black leadership. Because we felt the hunky didn't deserve a weekend off in it. Some went for atonement, some had to go for war. And you don't want to all be praying at the same time. Somebody got to watch while somebody prays. So the word was, you can leave Coakley out there. God knows we don't like him no way. And we have trained most of our people never to like him, especially in the public. Yeah, he might go speak with Eric Mohammed, and he might speak at the slave, but long as he stay deep up in Brooklyn, long as that shit don't get downtown, we be okay. Long as Coakley don't get around nobody with no money, we be okay. And that ain't that, let me strike, big money. Now this lady make a couple of hundred thousand a year. You need to see what a couple of hundred thousand, those of you, who believe you're gonna fight for the black when you just get a little raise or you just get that job or you just get that, hit that lottery. Those of you who think money will make you come forth. Look at the $200,000 lady that couldn't come up at all. And I could tell you the $400,000 PR man, Richard, 
who call me every day like a little wimp on a pee. I must leave a message for you, Mr. Coakley, to tell you that we're canceling the program. Now call me back, Mr. Coakley. 400,000 a year plus bonus. Sylvia Rome. Sylvia Rome. Sylvia Rome. Head of something, East West Records, and this record, and that record. See, the media side, the record side of Time Warner, she the one that tried to kick all the ass that wasn't standing. She's the one that stood up and cussed the people. Up in Time Warner, little Black History Month committee, Sister Carol, she got up and said, fuck y'all and fuck y'all and who the fuck y'all think y'all are? That's who said it, Sylvia Rhone. And had people in there crying, Sister Carol. Here's a sister put in a P.O. order to get the FOI to do security for the program. And she stands over that little sister and says, who the fuck do you think you are in a time like this to suggest something like that? She said, your check is signed by corporate. This ain't gonna be nobody's personal agenda for no black power. Who do you all think you are? And here are some people trying to serve black people with black people. That's, that's what they assigned them to do. Here's some money to serve black people for black people. And they got beat up. And this wasn't even but conversation. We ain't even got to the shit shit yet. But that's Sylvia Rohn. Now that, that's the best picture I can find. See, she's deep on how she wear her makeup and shit. This is another little evidence. Sylvia is faithful to Lake Home, Makwatmat, Natural Mate Foundation in Bronze 4. I guess at a certain stage of your career, you have levels of black. This is bronze four shade. This is uh, something in the, only in the corporal. You know, you don't look, I'm going to the slave. Which level of black will I be tonight? You know you don't do that. So this is a corporate thing. This, was, this is the, the right stuff. The right stuff. And th that's Sylvia Rohn. You need to remember her. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to read a memo that she got. This is a memo sent to Sylvia Rome, bro. Imagine, wait till you hear this. This is sent to Sylvia from uh, 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 a, big, a big, big Dick Parsons. He's the black president of Time Warner. Dick Parsons, Big Dick Parsons. <laughs> to Sylvia Rome, our roots run deep subject. Attached are the talking points that are being used to address media inquiries regarding our roots run deep. Jim Noonan, has the charge to respond to the media calls. But I wanted you to know how we're handling the change in speakers. It is my suggestion and hope that you and your folks will follow this presentation, particularly at tomorrow night's dinner, which was two Thursdays ago. At this point, I don't think we need another press release. Now, a question you may get is, who made the decision to modify the program, question mark? My suggestion is that you simply say I did, not him, her. That she say I did, but she didn't. This is what you need to know. The, the white man said no. She's being told. Now, a question you may get is this. Who made the decision to modify the program? My suggestion is that you say I did. I concluded that some of the original speakers created the potential for controversy which might detract from this very successful lecture series and I decided to make a change. She's being told by the black president of Time Warner Get your ass out there and tell them you did it. We ain't got no memo of her writing back saying, but boss, I didn't do it. Then she takes it to someone lower than her and says, the boss man said I did it. But shit, you work for me, you tell them you did it. This is how corporations work. This is why we ain't in none of them. Because we don't work like that. That's how they work. Stay the whole thing in the field, say. Somebody in the house say, go out there and tell the niggas to sow the line on the field over there and get them cows and right, clean them pigs off, blah, 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 blah. So you get the message. You got it. So listen to this. He said, if you're uncomfortable with this, 
let me know and we'll work out a different approach. Now this is, this is big time corporate memorandum. Big time corporate memorandum. Now a question you may get is who made the decision to modify the program? My suggestion is that you simply say I did. Now remember what the New York Post said. New York Post said that Abraham Foxman wrote Gerald Levin uh, and in a fit of belittling us said after brief reflection, brief reflection, because the whole, if you read deep into that, to Coakley is a racial huxler. What the fuck is that? I don't even know. I'm asking everybody, what is a huxler? I don't, I don't even know what it is. But to belittle us. Now, what do you think Foxman thinking about now? What do you think Levin is saying to Foxman? You told me you had this shit covered. Now I got all this controversy. He said, the speakers may create a potential for controversy. We are over, way over the potential for controversy. We on the edge of our seats. We be, so since that already happened, I told him, said, well, why don't you just tell him to go ahead and have a program because it's already controversial. I mean... Some of the unity that has flashed across this, I'm sure, has incited them to know that right now it might be any issue that might come up to kill another black Barbie doll that might compel black people to unite and go forth. It doesn't, it won't take much anymore. People are fed up and they also got a glimpse of strength. The glimpse of strength changes the option. I didn't mean to stand in front of you, brother Eric. Here's another memo. Our Roots Run Deep is a lecture series that has for three years brought together some of the leading voices on contemporary African-American issues sponsored by our domestic record labels, Atlantic Records. I remember Aretha Franklin was on. You know, we got to read some of the names of the people who own some of these things. Atlanta Recording Group, Electra Entertainment Group, and Warner Brothers Records. I know I've been many years with Quincy Jones and Warner Brothers. In fact, we were supposed to have heard from Quincy Jones or something. Well, we hear from him yet? <laughs> Quincy Jones was supposed to call Gerald Levin, I believe. They was going to try to get Quincy Jones to call Gerald Levin for us. Yeah, that's deep. Oh, but you know what's even deeper than that, sister? Let me tell you something that's deeper than that. No, let me tell you something that's deeper than that. The woman that Quincy Jones married is the girl that Roman Polanski raped at the age of 14 that made him leave the country. Yes, but let me tell you one deeper. Her father was a Satanist who hung out with Anton LaVey and the Hollywood Satan connection. And so her father, Nakinsky, was tight with uh, Anton LaVey, Sammy Davis used to hang out with them. He talked about being in these sexual rituals and stuff. And the key the point to all of this is that where have we taken all this dialogue on secret societies? We've now looked at it even deeper and found ritualistic, satanistic activity inside of it. And if this was a normal night, that's what I'd be telling you about, that we've now gone through these things another level and found some even deeper things. And... Seems like as we get this close, we're getting even a deeper react. But I want you to know that. And then remember, sister, that the movie Nakinsky did to get in the public was called Cat People, where she played a black panther who turned into some devil or some shit with Roddy McDowell. Some of you might remember that movie. But, and, and it goes in companion with her father being a Satanist. Anyway, we'll talk about that uh, later tonight. The lecture series, which targets professionals in the music and entertainment industry, has provided a forum for the discussion of critical issues like the upswing of violence and the root causes of crime. Now, you see how they try to deflect the attention? The upswing of violence. Now, what do a corporation care about violence other than how close is it to us? Because they created the tight economic situation that made tight money situation, that reduced the opportunity for decent people to make a living, that became the climate that breeded crime. So why would they want to get to what's up with violence if they ain't going to get to the root of that? 
And that's how deep their roots run. It says the lecture series is intended as a proactive acknowledgement of black history. Well, what would we then take as the real lesson of black history? That any time a white man shows, anything a white man says goes, even in your own house and opportunity. And that would be what they would want us to learn about white-run black history. You see, in a climate of domination where whites figure we're on the edge of extermination, the perception to them is that in this particular climate, under these various circumstances, that what they would really want us to know about Black History Month is slavery. And in fact, in every city I go in, one of the biggest articles is about plantations. I mean, I want you to pick up these travel magazines, the New York Times, any paper on Sunday, look in there and look at how they plan up plantations. All in New Orleans, uh, all across the South, uh, even in Atlanta, all of the papers running heavy, heavy plantation stories. Uh, where was that? Uh, I was in, uh, uh, what city was that? In the whole thing, in the whole city journal, was about whose plantation this was. And that was all the town was about. But anyway, man, they get on there. It is but one facet of an ongoing, extensive corporate community outreach program that is part of the Warner Music Group's approach to corporate social responsibility. Well, we'd have to look at some of the other things that they're doing, seeing how they're doing this one. In sum, these forums were and are intended to be gathering where people from all walks of life can come together with the experience, the richness of black culture, and the contribution it has made to our collective well-being, as well as a discussion to promote self-esteem and positive self-awareness among African Americans. They were not and are not intended to be divisive. Now, if you were to talk about the richness of black culture and the contribution it has made to our collective well-being, our collective well-being is us suffering and them benefacting. That's our collective well-being. Them on top, us on the bottom. So when you become divisive in black history, you're trying to turn away from what they call that's right, our collective well-being, as well as a discussion to promote self-esteem, self-esteem, and positive self-awareness among African Americans. They were not and are not intended to be divisive. Some of the original speakers provided the potential for controversy, which would detract from the mission of the lecture series. Accordingly, we have modified the program and Conrad Mohammed and Steve Coakley will not appear. That was uh, some of that internal dialogue. Thought that was a little interesting. Well, let's see what we got here. Let's see how we can get into this a little bit. Let me tighten this up. Anyway, what's her name? What is her name? What is her name? Sylvia Rome. You can't say it no louder than that. What's her name? Because she need to know all over this country, this tape goes out. Me and Brother Maddox did the radio. We was on Stevie Wonder Station last week on, out there in L.A. She's in L.A. So we on the station on Stevie. Oh, and my man, Brother Jamal, called me. You know Brother Jamal, who's the producer of the show out there, said they catching flack because the Warner Music Division is pissed that we went on there and jammed the Warner Fake Black History Commission. Oh, he called me today, Brother Maddox. Said, we better come on again. Because obviously, somebody got mad. And so Stevie Wonder got the only black talk show out there in L.A. from 4.30 a.m. to 6 a.m. You all heard me and Karinga do that show. And this is everybody listening. So we out there bumping Time Warner. And he said, man, it was weird. All them, uh, see, it's a lot of payola in this business. See, we on the tip of some big shit. You know how much Sylvia Rome make a year? I want you to look at her deeply. Two million, three hundred thousand. How much? So when the white man say, get your ass down there and kill that Black History Month, she say, what you want me to do? Take off my clothes, get my gun, 
get my whip, get my noose, get them ball and chains, boss man, and she cussed and belittled, little stabbed people. And I don't mean to by calling them little, but I mean people who had responsibility, who have nowhere in this corporate giant, making little bitty money, and they making this big, big money. So here she is around there belittling and pushing him down and talking about him like a dog. Who do they think? You get out there and sign this memo and say you did it. They said, but we didn't do it. She said, I don't give a fuck. Get your ass. Corporate signs your check. And I don't mean to be profane, but she said fuck 15 times in one quick hour. Even pulled up on one sister and was going to try to kick her ass. This is yesterday at 3 o'clock. No, I'll take the 4.15. Now, this is some deep stuff, y'all. I'm telling y'all. And what with the... Well, hey, look, you're going to lose your job, 2300000 for some Coakley and Conrad and Sharpton? You kill to protect that shit. You understand? 2300000 brother? And then now we should feel betrayed. Because now we see more than athletes got money. See, we think the athletes is the only ones with the money. It's thousands of these junior executives with salaries and bonuses that we never see in a generation. And we ain't never got none of them our way. When I look up, there's LeBaron Taylor of Sony Records funding the boule luncheon for the students. The record industry ain't trying to build no disruption out here. When they look up and saw that the little black kids was making lullaby songs, let's do the nasty. And the birth rate went up. They said, well, you know, we got to kill that dude the nasty because that birth rate went up. In fact, I was just showing them an article I got. Pale race close to extinction. January 28th, Kansas City Star. Pale race close to extinction. Those that once dominated may soon be absent. And the theory was that if your family didn't make two, if you bring a man and a woman together and that's two, you need to come back with two to make level birth rate. No one white country in the world got over a 1.8 birth rate. No white country in the world got over 1.8 birth rate. Some of them are 0.9, which means that for every two to get together, one or less come about. So two die and one is left. And then that marries with another two and then one dies and none are left. And soon we will have them but, anyway, Sylvia Rome. What's her name? Sylvia How much she make? Where does she live? No, 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 she live in, she live in New York. She, but the, at 2.3 million, you can live all over the place. You, you don't never had to forget about ever paying no rent. You got a million over there and a million over here. You don't, where do you stay? Wherever you want. We need to find out where Sylvia Rome lives because when we start breaking down the options that we have, I'd love to go to her house for some little black revolution. But most importantly, to spank the butts of them two Africans who flunky for whites and thought they could never be seen. You see, in the old days, we would have never known what we know about the inside. <clears throat> Our strategy was sound. The way we stuck together, was sound. And the soundness of that gave us full, what we call that, uh, well, full disclosure. We have one or two loose ends. One we still trying to twist back into the fold, but basically, there you go, that's right. <laughs> yeah. See, see, we pledged to be straight, so it's some shit we don't want to break yet, but we're going to break the whole story soon, because there's some more to be told to this. But we need to find out where Sylvia Rome lives. Because unless they know we will come to the door, then they will forever punk black people, black people we will never see, who will give in and lose their jobs and go out and think that it is not good to be black because you will be punished. You may be, but you will find whatever you lose with them, you will gain two, three times over. So, but we need to tell them this. I tell you, Susan Taylor says, she said, look, brother, she said, I don't know what you be talking about. You bear witness. Right. She said, but you better get me some of them tapes up here because damn, I want to see what the hell everybody don't want nobody to see. 
She said, this is deep. You better hurry up and get me some tapes up here. Because that also meant that those people who were in a jam, this sister's in a jam. She down there with a million dollar operation in New Orleans. The, the, the essence, uh, big old essence thing she had last year. I was down there for it. I think Brother Maddox was down there. Brother Conrad was down there. She had speakers, forums, concerts, and everything. It was a massive organizational achievement. And I know all them blacks down there in New Orleans who vended and made money and were very happy that that thing had come their way. And so she looked up and found that the governor of Louisiana uh, uh, pulled back affirmative action. And as yokey as it is, the sister went and pulled all of her shit up off of Louisiana. See, you don't understand how many millions that means when somebody got plane tickets and hotel reservations and speakers booked and they're going to they gonna agree to stop and do everything all over and go someplace else. That's a massive commitment to get on the phone and to speak to Brother Coakley when those don't even want to be seen speaking to me and to say I'm with you takes a, a, a hell of a commitment. That's a hell of a thing and I, I learned something from her about this about money and commitment. Now, uh, let's see here. We, uh, let's look a little at this Time Warner thing. Now, ironically, uh, this story appeared in the, uh, this story appeared in the Village Voice, uh, January 16th. It was a story, the story was entitled, Merge Overkill. When big media gets too big, what happens to open debate? It's clear now, it's clear now, merge overkill. When big media gets too big, what happens to debate? So it broke down the relate. I said, damn, this is too timely. Here we are looking for a target, and a white man shakes down another white, white man and gives us the goods. See, this is a result of two whites fighting. And I told you all that one of the highest plots of black liberation was white on white aggression. So here we got a white fighting another white. And I'm going to tell you what's in those little dark and poor. He's the head of certain divisions. We're going to get that together. I got another sheet up here. I'll even make that a little uh, stronger for you. Uh, one is uh, this over here is Turner Broadcasting. That's uh, what Turner's bringing in in the merger, if the merger finishes coming about. Uh, that next column is WEA Manufacturing, uh, Atari and Hasbro. You heard of them? Uh, Time Incorporated is the next one. That's uh, where it says Time Incorporated is Time Magazine, Fortune, Life, Sports Illustrated, Money, People, Entertainment Weekly, Sports Illustrated for Kids, Time for Kids, uh, Perina, uh, Rally Talk, uh, Martha Stewart's Living, uh, oh, the Book of the Month Club. Uh, they are loaded with stuff. Uh, what else they got here? Uh, the Bubble Gump Shrimp Company, uh, Oxmoor House, a uh, progressive former Southern Accents cooking book, uh, Time Online, Southern Progress Corporation, uh, Asia Week, uh, oh shit, a bunch of stuff, Smart Living, uh, Little Brown and Company, uh, Warner Books, Pathfinder Books, Time Life Books, uh, Time Life Music, Time Life Video, Time Life Digital, Time Life Medical. Time, time, and time has got time up. That's all in there. Time Magazine, all the rest of them. Here is Time Warner Cable. Now, you all ought to know where they are up in here on the cable. Right. Right. 11.5 million subscribers, Summit Communications, KBLcom, Time Warner Entertainment, Advanced Newhouse, Cable Vision, Industries, New York City Cable Group, Time Warner Cable International, putting cable services in China, Japan, Taiwan, France. FSN, Financial Services Network, Full Service Network, I'm sorry, with Silicon Graphics, AT&T Network Systems, Scientific Atlanta, Hewlett Packard, Time Warner Communications, Telephone Service, U.S. West, Time Warner Cellular, Cell Phone Service, the Sega Channel, Court TV. Yeah, the, now comes before us the case of Time Warner versus the Africans. Holy, what else? What does that say? Holy, what does that say? What does that say, sister? You're right, said B-E-T. Right. B-E-T with Vicom. 
That's Summer Redstone. Viacom, he got the VH1 channel. Oh, boy, Prime Star. Channel 5, Asia, with Viacom and Sony. See, they all work together even though they're competing interest. Oh, uh, what we got over here on this side? Over here we got a uh, Time Warner Music Group. It was within this music group where we were given a quiet little Black History Month that ended up putting Gerald Levin on a tightrope. Say, what did Gerald Levin do when he heard all Maddox was after him? Got his ass up on that tightrope. That's a caricature of Gerald Levin that's out now in, a, in, a, in New Yorker magazine, which says that his ass is in hot water with the hunkies and gonna be dumped soon. But check this out, though. All it now, the plot thickens. The plot thickens. The damn New Yorker is owned by Murdoch. Right. The one who set his ass up with us. Right. You see that shit? You see that shit? Right. Let's give a hand for some white-on-white -white violence. Right. They fucked up and brought us in, and we swung on everybody. We had swung on all of them. When they let her out for Murdoch, we kicked Murdoch's ass and Murdoch man come around here. Luther, Luther, what's his name? Luther's Luther, hundred black men. I need to ask Luther what he doing lurking around these things. Luther Gatlin. Yeah, he come lurking around trying to get Tony Faye to get Sharpton in the back room to cross Coakley. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen. We closed ranked on that shit. Yeah, you might not like it. You might not like it, but it is the way we're telling you it is. They play some deep games on us, Alton, but we deep their ass back, though. I'm telling y'all, y'all will never know how poor we pulled this shit off. And we ain't finished. It ain't. It's just coming in round two. Anyway, anyway, let's, we'll be back to the uh, Warner Music Group. In fact, because remember now, what happened? I get a call from New York. Says, Steve, there's an article in the New York Post which says that Murdoch is on the outs and it's being, it's featured from a story in the New Yorker. So here you got New York Post says Levin is in trouble, but the New Yorker got the story. Now, unless you know interlocking directorships, unless you know the density of corporations, you would know that that was a hook, that was a jab and a right hook. That meant that Murdoch was attacking over at a group of whites who were like him. The dead. All of those things die when the revolution comes. So the largest holding of record copyright will die when the revolution comes. So why would they get caught advancing the revolution? Let's see what the Atlantic Group, Atlantic Records, Reno Records, Time Warner Audio Books, Atlantic Classics, Atlantic Nashville, Beggar's Banquet, Big Beat, Celtic, Heartbeat, Curb, Lava, Mama, Matador, Mess, Blue Moon. Some of these, I can't, ooh, this is tripping me out. Electra Entertainment Group. Electra, East West Asylum, Electra Sire, Warner Brothers Records, Warner Brothers Reprise, Giant, Maverick, Quest, Warner Brothers Sire, Warner Brothers Nashville, Warner Brothers Reprise, Home Video, American Recordings, Slash, and Tommy Boy. Warner Music International, WEA Warner Music Thailand, D-Day Entertainment, yeah, you got that right, Musa Music, NVC Arts Entertainment, UK China Records, Warner Music, uh, 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 this is a Switzerland, Combined Affiliates in the Netherlands, strike, the Netherlands, strike, the Netherlands and Belgium, uh, Ted Deck, Tell Deck, Arato, non, non, none, none such, Finlanda, O, strike, C, G, D, Cold Blue, Carreri, D-R-O, W-E-A Latin, P-L-W. See, I don't want to underestimate what you may know about one of these, so for the record, this tape, Time Warner, did it, did it, Time Warner. This tape goes all over the country. Last time I was here, November 1st, I told you ain't a city I can't go in that I don't see them slave tapes. Did it, it. So in all these cities, over all this land, we must lay out Time Warner 
in a way that Time Warner knows they'll be pressed on every end of this. Time Warner shit is in deep trouble. Some shit is brewing like they ain't never seen before, and they're going to be an example to other hunkies. And a mere little 1,000 air like Foxman, we won't even give him a fart in the face. A little tramp. See, he's so busy, y'all. See, there was a moment when somebody wanted to make Foxman the main issue. So I said, well, let's add up how much everybody worth. 11, 400 million. Murdoch, 4 billion. Foxman, 200,000. I said, now one thing I know about the cochlea, I had to start to bop at the top and work down. So it'd be a while before I get down there with the foxes, man. But I'd be damned if we didn't have to fight hard to stop him from becoming the primary focus of this attack. It was said that if only Foxman apologized and squared away our credibility and cleaned up our profiles, oh, Sister Camille, if only Foxman did that, we'd all be all right. We said, hold it now, wait just a minute. Foxman ain't but a punk in this affair. Foxman, the message tonight is, I'm sorry, brother. We just ain't got no time for you right now. You and the ADL are real little pains in our ass. But it's in our ass. And every time we sit, we sit on you. And we're not even going to give you no attention because on the Tuesday, let's hook some more shit up now, on the Tuesday that the first Post editorial came out January 28th, there was a meeting right here in New York of the World Zionist Congress. Right, right here in New York, Edgar Brofman got reelected head of the World Zionist Congress. Right. Now, do you think they sitting up there and not talking about what's going on? All right. About how important it is at this stage of their activity to make a point of fucking with black people? And what does it mean when Levin looks over and says, Abe, why you put me in this shit? Why you, I got enough problems already walking the tightrope. Why you put me in this shit? Maybe, maybe Hunky's trying to use us to bump Levin ass out. But we say, I don't care if it's Levin, heaven, hell, Detroit, or Cincinnati, whoever sit in the chair will get the rest of the heat that he was getting. And no one else down the line gonna get it. Whoever may emerge, that's irrelevant. Anyway. Warner Music Group. Columbia House Music and Video Club. You know that Columbia thing you get 12 uh, CDs for a dollar? You always wondered how can somebody afford to sell all them CDs for one dollar? And I know I got some paperwork over here. Many of you all sent for them first 12 and never got that second one. <laughs> and that might not be a bad strategy. Send for all that shit. So they got some more stuff up there. Let's right over there. Filmed Entertainment Division. This is, you know, time. This is the time, so you gotta, we gotta do this. We gotta understand there's two separate things that went on here. Time Warner is the coming together of major families to make a corporation. It, I remember when it was just Time, and I remember when it was just Warner. So we have to keep in context the fact that this is a very wide operation, and we have to be uh, clear on how everybody started. Here's a Time Incorporated, please look profile. Now, we know that Time and Warner are all in Rockefeller Center. Right. So who might be their buddy? All right. Who might be their buddy? Right. Somebody we've been, look we've been looking for him? All right. Have or maybe you haven't. <laughs> I've been looking for him. Yeah. All right. Huh? Yeah, there you go. There you go, Baba. See, I was up in Terrytown a couple weeks ago with the crew up in Mount Vernon. See, we getting all in Mount Vernon and New Haven, all running around Yale. You should see 20, 30 of us run around yell taking shit <laughs> talking about this, look at the devil all in the ground and shit they the white people see us coming in packs like that and jump out here i think you may want this information 
looking in her eyes and shit and see and said, these motherfuckers is looking for somebody. So they start just giving us shit to get us off of them. And they know the difference in us. They know the difference in us. So anyway, so we, we got to remember these are two different corporations coming together. And I want to lay out a little chart I made. There's time. That's the time. This is, uh, this is from a book called Everyone's Business. And it profiled every industry and gave profiles on every, by 10 or 15 corporations, say oil, law, investment banking, uh, uh, detergents, uh, media buys. Uh, this is an excellent background primer that you can buy publicly. And though now the book, I think, was done in about 1990 or so, uh, some of the later parts about who actually owns, owns it, some of it is outdated. But see, it says history, history of time incorporated. Henry Luce was born in China. Now remember they're talking about how they had China cable, China this, China books. See where the old man come from China. Right. Not that he's Chinese. Right. He a hunky. <laughs> like I saw the post through that editorial the other day. How about, what about hunky? We're talking about what a name for white people and they come up with hunky. Hey, didn't they say that? What did they say? What about hunky? No, I said what about hunky? Y'all see that? Y'all didn't see that editorial in the post? What day was that? Say, what about honky? Yeah, that remind me of that famous song. Y'all remember it? What's it all about, honky? Is it just for the honkies we name? What's it all about? Anyway, uh, Henry Lou. Missionary. Now we know we're trying trouble. We have new missionaries. Stayed in that country until he left for prep school in Connecticut. Okay, Connecticut crew. We got this New Haven, Connecticut in the house. Is Mount Vernon, New York in the house? All right, all right. Uh, so we know we got to do some Connecticut checking on the Loose family. We're going to find it too. Reports that Loose once said, I'll, I was never disillusioned with or by America but I was, from my earliest manhood, dissatisfied with America. That's why he helped shoot Kennedy. No, he did. Ain't no doubt about that shit. Uh, and that's what we're coming to that next, Bobby. You're right. Uh, I'm, uh, dissatisfied with America. America was not being as great and as good as I knew she could be, as I believe with every nerve and fiber God himself had intended her to be. Luce devoted his publication to the cause of shaping America along the lines of the divine plan. You see that shit? To lose this meant glorifying the Republicans. Now I think that guy, that Republicans, that's kind of interesting. Right. Who that black man who president at the time wanted? Big Dick Parsons. Big Dick. His name is Big Dick Parsons. All right. <laughs> you know the one that said, if they ask you who did it, say I did. Not him, but you. Who, who did he tell? Who did Richard Parsons? Who? How much she make? Where she live? We're getting close. We're getting close. She's hooked by satellite, so she hears us tonight. Now, now, so now, so now, we know that Parsons, Big Dick Parsons, the president, who come from a bank. What bank he come from? What? Dime. Dime went to time. Hmm. And. He's a what? He's, who is he a flunky for? What mayor? And Rodney, right, Rodney. Who? Boo. You mean the one that loved Castro? Huh? Yeah. Okay. So, 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 and, and I think if you ain't careful, before you know it, they'll probably appoint that nigga to have some, some empowerment zone shit. I mean, before you, if, before you know it, 
If this shit keep going on like it is, Brother McIntosh, they'll point him to some empowerment zone stuff. He'll probably be head of all empowerment zone in New York if we ain't careful. He what? Hold it now. Hold it now. Wrangle? Wrangle? Big Charlie Wrangle? Trilateral Commissioner Charlie Wrangle. Right? Trilateral Commissioner Charlie Wrangle, right? Okay. He only won a six on there. Big Charlie. Big Charlie. So, so, oh, anyway, okay. So, what is, you need to know Dick Parsons closely related to Giuliani. He believed, I believe he headed his transition team or was significant in his transition team. And he's a big time Republican. And Luce was a Republican. I just wanted to bring that inner connection to you for that moment. I just wanted you to pick up on that. Now, let's go back. Now, at Time Warner, when we looked over at who is one of the biggest donors how many of you all ever heard of the Council on Foreign Relations? All right. Now, I got some tapes back there I just did in the last two weeks. Council on Foreign Relations 96. And uh, part two is gone already. It's just available on video about Time Warner and Council on Foreign Relations part two. But I looked over in the 1995 yearbook to see who gave the most money to the Council on Foreign Relations or anybody. And here, in its annual report, were the people who gave over 10000 or more. Who we got here? Big Jerry. Jerry Levin. Right. Where's he at? Where's he work at? What's he standing on? All right. Now, Big Jerry is one of the big, big droppers of money. Now, the Council on Foreign Relations is sitting over there with all of the powerful people in New York going over there, all the people in the world going over to the council. Now, I know y'all don't fuck with them at all. You will, but I know it's not one of your tendencies. But you will. I know it's not one of your tendencies, but you will. Because we put the full court press on Jerry. We, if he go around the three-point line and he go under the basket, we got to go where he go. So if he go under the basket or go into the huddle or go in the locker room, and the locker room is at the CFR, then we're going to have to go over there in the locker room. So, with Jerry at the CFR, and the CFR started, oh, in the late 1900s, and we talk about them a little bit, and this and that, and they coming forth, and they're the Rhodes Rothschild money coming together to form a secret society, and Levin is over there giving money. What happens when a reporter of Levin's goes to a CFR meeting, and he is to report on something that he hears? Or... Can he report on what he hears? And let's see. We found out that at the council, remember that tape I used to play for y'all about Jesse Jackson? We was asking him about going to the Council of Foreign Relations, and he says, I've never really been to a meeting, but I spoke at some. <laughs> y'all remember that? OK. Well, well, what they have at the council, this is from their 95 yearbook. They have something called the Rule of Non-Attribution. It means that if you go there and hear one of the people who are running the world talk, you do not have the right to tell anyone in the public what you heard them say. Now, we're trying to vouch for how is it that the whole world don't know enough about corporate power and naming the names, which is what my little contribution is. Why is it that I'm even needed when, in fact, a power analysis is the beginning to understanding any subject. You must know who the stakeholders are. So here we are with the most powerful people in the world saying that they have a rule of non-attribution and that no one can relate to anyone else what someone says. So in the 1995 yearbook, I mean the annual report, they had a little box, they had these little box with people talking about how much they love the council, Brother Eric. So they had a reporter from Time, the, the main political reporter at Time magazine. He had a little box. What's his name? What's his name? Michael. Michael. I know you can't see it. I know some of y'all is kind of small in the back, and you might not be able to see it. So, 
Uh, oh, there we go. On this side, let me see if I can. No, I guess that's as big as it goes. Okay. Michael Kramer, political columnist, Time Magazine. Now, we want to see what happens when he goes there. What does he write about? Since they can't say, he says, the council is an important one-stop shopping site, a place where I can connect with an elect... I don't even know that word. What is that word? What's that mean? Ah, uh, from many places, okay. When I'm covering foreign affairs story, the people who most frequently make those contributions turn up here. Oh, he goes down here and he says, the council is a great place to observe those who have been in and out of government and to watch how they operate when they're in various, when they're, when they're in versus when they're out. The dissonance between what they said then and what they say now is wonderful. Even if I never write about it, it informs my sense of cynicism, which knows no bounds. It's scary, but it reminds me what life is like. Now, I want you to pick up on that. He's saying that he goes there, but he can't report on, even if I do not write about it. See, this was the problem all along. The theory was there were places that they go, there are things that they say that are the heaviest things they do, but they are off limits in the public. So here we come intercepting these things, throwing them into the public, and then we meet with this level of consternation. All right? Now, while we're at that, see, you got to do the full, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, the shotgun effect here. I'm the... I'm to do the fire hydrant act on as many in the circle, as many in the circle as we can get. So now, what we got there is, that's what happened at the council. I looked in there and saw a picture of somebody meeting over at the council. Oh, Bugliani. He said, we've seen an examining, take a look at, look at what they're talking about over here. We've seen... We've been examining the consequences of wealth shifting to the Asia Pacific region, studying changes in Muslim societies. Hmm. And what is Giuliani over there talking about? He's talking about revitalizing New York City. Right, he's attacking the mosque. That's what he's doing. You're right, Baba. Now it makes sense. He's up there studying revitalizing New York City, the international capital. Now the question comes, what if that was a black man? Would the white boys call the black man over there to tell the black man how good he's delivering for the white man? Why isn't Dinkins in that picture? Because there's a certain point in the day that even a nigga that's theirs, they can't even trust. So while Dinkins was trying to play it safe, man, the white boys needed a white boy because of down on your luck, you need that white boy. Anyway, you just need to know Giuliani over there. Now, who are the only four blacks in the history of the Council on Foreign Relations ever to be a director? Do you know? Oh, you will know. This is a list. Now, those of you who buy this tape, you're going to get a reason I put this up here now. I really could give you a rally. We'll be rallying when we be here supporting the speaker tomorrow night. How many of y'all coming back tomorrow night? That's not enough of you. All right? You need to tell other people to come tomorrow night. This is the master list of every director in the history of the Council on Foreign Relations from 1921 down to those who've been put in in 93 and are still serving. You got that? Now that's locked, that's freeze-framed into the tape. Mr. Brown, you here tonight? I'll be, okay, y'all get that real good? Because this needs to be, this is going all over the country. This is the name of every person who ever served. It ain't never been but one black woman in the history of the Council on Foreign Relations on the board of directors. One black woman. Charlene hunter God. here she is right here. Right there. But check this out. Three weeks ago, I'm on the New York train coming up here to go to Mount Vernon to give a lecture. 
And who's sitting across from me on the train with four cellular phones, uh, Brother Counsel? Four, she had four phones, a little TV, a little computer, earplugs, headsets, and shit going everywhere. I looked up, and there she was, and I wrote a little note. I said, Sister, God would punish me if I did not ask you what it was like to be up there with them whites when negative things came down on Africans. And she looked at that, she read it, she looked over at me, she said, what do you want me to say? I said, well, those things are negative. Do you need help? Are you, well, is there something wrong? Are you fighting these things? I, I just got to ask you, what is it like? And she reread it again. I got it up here, too. I can read you exactly what I said to her. And I wrote it out. I felt like a fool for doing it, though. But again, I felt God would punish me if I didn't ask her. I mean, I really, I had to ask. It's all right if she said no, but I had to ask. And don't you, don't let me catch you saying, well, I'm not going to try it because it couldn't be. Let it not be. Then you throw it in before it comes up. All right? Now, four blacks, the, only, the first black ever to be on the council is Franklin Hall Williams. The first time you brought me here, Attorney Maddox, I was at a hotel in Manhattan, and right down the street from a hotel was a big, was a old house donated to him, for him. It was a for uh, 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 ambassadors and stuff. It was a, a, a Franklin Hall Williams uh, Center. Right up here at 50, West 57th Street is where it's at. Uh, and uh, you need to check into him. He was one of the first, uh, uh, one of the Rockefeller key ambassadors in Ghana. In fact, he was ambassador to Ghana. That was what? Oh uh, Yeah, yeah, Phelps Stokes Fund. He headed it. That's it. That's it. The second black, Clifton Wartime, New York, Rockefeller Foundation Chairman, Teachers Pension Fund Chairman, former State Department Deputy Director until they punked him out of the State Department because they needed a white guy. Those are the only four blacks, Donald McHenry, who replaced Andy Young. Now, Andy Young went on the trilateral, Donald McHenry went on the CFR. Those are the only four blacks in the history of the Council on Foreign Relations ever to be a director. And there you see the names of the people and the years they were directors. Gene Kirkpatrick, Alan Greenspan, Lewis Preston, who was head of the World Bank, Walter Winston, who was at City Corps, uh, uh, Ken of Dam, uh, he's, uh, he's out of the University of Chicago, Donna Shalala, you know her, Health and Human Services. Gerald Corrigan, he was at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Leslie Galb, he's the president of the council. Robert Allen heads AT&T. Uh, 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 who we got here? Maurice Greenberg works for the council now. Richard Hormats, uh, vice chairman of Goldman Sachs. Richard Holbrook, he's in uh, Bosnia. Thomas Donahue, just lost head of AFL-CIO. William Crow, former head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was Clinton's man to protect him in the election against the war. John Reed, former head of City Corps. William Cohen, former Senator. Strobe Calvert, Deputy Secretary of State. James D. Robinson III, American Express. Tom Foley, former Senator. Glenn Watts, former head of the uh, Communication Workers Union. Uh, Karen Elliott House, Associate Counsel on Foreign Relations. Richard Cheney, former Secretary of Defense. What you can see is that Brother Steve, knows the names of the people who have exploited black people, and I know their profiles without looking at anything. When you got black people who could associate with these people, why would you want to let me get close to them? Because you want them to be effective Africans. My, I have never asked you to do anything for me, to buy the tapes, to share, we get into the information, but why is the information, the mere information, the danger? And why would you be worried about the council? The council, you need to know, has set something up new. They got a sister in there profiling her. Her name is Crystal Nix. She's an assistant secretary for democracy, human rights, labor, a member of the Secretary of State's policy planning staff, which is a very important, influential internal option. Uh, and for those of you who got to go, I got the brother Coakley Tates in the back. Sister Marilyn's back there. Please, I need your support. But the council has set up, you need to know about this, this is new shit now, the Center for Preventive Action. Now that's some black shit. Because in the meeting of the studies, they said Baranda, Baruti, excuse me, Rwanda, Baruti, South Africa, everywhere you look at where they were fighting conflict, 
Most of my work involves ethnic conflict issues, ho helping to formulate government policy with respect to conflict resolution, prevention, development of accountability mechanisms such as war, crime tribunals, and truth commissions. Yeah. Okay, what does that mean? That means that if a revolution came, who we would be killing would be these people. But what are they doing? They're setting themselves up to be the referee when they're the problem. You need to know every time a revolution came, this crew was able to negotiate themselves back into power. So they could give up control, but retain power. Deacons had control, but he didn't have power. I guess y'all already knew that. That was no big problem. <laughs> Say, yes. And remember, he was tied up in some cable shit himself with Time Warner. All right? Now, speaking of Time Warner, what about Jack Warner? When we've been talking, we talk about Masons. We talk about Skull and Bones. We talk, what is Jack Warner's relationship with this? Well, I found a picture of old Jack. I had a book called The Masons Who Helped Shape Our Nation. And in it was this picture. You'll like this. Look at that. Jack Warner. Time is loose. And Warner is Jack Warner. There he is in his Masonic hat. You all don't know what that hat is. That's the, that's the main Masonic hat. Brother Jack Warner, 33rd degree has been a creative force in American motion picture industry. His name has become synonymous with film excellence, and he has produced hundreds of the finest cinemata cinema cinematic dramas and comedies that came out of Hollywood. Jack L. Warner, 33rd degree. Now, what is the relationship of masonry and film? and the New York City. The film industry, of course, is noted for its great number of Freemasons. You see, you never looked at the film industry as a secret society. All those belittling examples of blacks were a part of conquering a race of people. Therefore, you belittle black people with your industry because your goal was to conquer them and take the pyramids that they put on the money because they were imposters. During the 20s, for instance, members of the Pacific Lodge number 233 of New York City were in Southern California and were impressed in learning of the many brethren in motion pictures. They suggested organizing a social club during its heyday, the resulting is the 233 Club, we better find it, had over 1,700 Masons of the motion picture and theatrical industries as its members, including Douglas Fairbanks, Harrow and Frank Lloyd, Wallace Berry, Louis Meyer, that was a golden, uh, what was that, uh, a Meyer, you know, a Meyer Golden, what was that? Metro Golden and Meyer, there we go, there we go. Ah, uh, ba ba ba. One of the outstanding patriotic activities of the club was the gigantic Pageant of Liberty in Los Angeles Coliseum, July 5th, 1926. So we're getting an early example of their power. We're now 60, 60, uh, 65, 60, damn 70 years later down there. We're 70, I can't count, right? I'm all excited I can't count. We're 70 years later. So we're talking about this is what they had then. No radio, no TV. Before an audience of 65,000 and employing over 2,500 actors and a chorus of 1,200, Brother Tom Mix, astride his horse Tony, portrayed Paul Revere, a Mason, and Brother Hoot Gibson was a Pony Express rider, another Mason. 32nd degree Scottish Rite. Uh, in 1901 in the Valley of Jersey City, George Brent, Eddie Cantor, Joey Brown, Charles Colburn, Dan Defoe, Gene Autry, Will Rogers. Oh, Disney. Disney. Disney, Eisner, Time, Warner. Oh, shit. This may be deeper than we think. This may be deeper than we think. You see, we may have looked at this as one thing, 
but it may actually be something else. It, I ain't said nothing. I ain't said nothing. Y'all ain't missed it. I said two words. Y'all ain't missed nothing. Oh, hold it now. Watch this. Watch this. You all ever heard of Dwight Clinton? I ain't said nothing. I want you to, there you go. So there you go. To ask me an honest. Say, we want to hear that talking all up here on the stage and stuff. Like that. Okay. Sometime it go out. Y'all, some of y'all streets named after him, ain't it? Yeah, school all day. This is, I, this is just a little sidebar. Why are we out there? I heard the other day when you all were on the radio, God said, well, damn, fuck all this. Let's do about it. Let's, let's clean up the education system. So I brought this for him. The same people who doing music, same people who running the government, is the same people who doing education. So if we get one, we'll get them all. So the guy that wanted us to get that needs to know by getting that, we're going to get this. The essential link between freedom and education is the crux of Freemasonry's traditional support of the free, non-secular public school system. Anyway, it goes on to talk about all of that. As early as 1802, when Brother DeWitt Clinton became mayor of New York City, we see an example of Freemasonry at work to create and support a public school system open to all. Brother Clinton raised in Holland Lodge, number 16, now number 8, in 1790, and serving as its master, in 1793 and Grand Master of the Lodge of New York from 1806 to 1819 promoted the establishment of a public school system for whites, I mean, for the state. Was the chief organizer of the 1805 Public School Society of New York and founded numerous institutions of literature, art, for education, general public, all of this in addition to his pioneering work in the construction of the Erie Canal. Damn, that was just a point, I just want to make that point with you that this could be wider than we think. There was a story that ran on me. Okay, there we go. All right. That was a message. Okay. This is a, uh, a, a, a show from a book called Bridges and Boundaries. It was put out by the Jewish Museum of New York. It was anti-me. It had a 16-page piece on me that ran in Esquire magazine, May of 1989. But I wanted to show you who funded it. Right, there you go. There you go. You see, it, this was done in 89 and 90. This is a museum exhibit that went all over the country, but it started right here at the Jewish Museum of New York. Funded by Philip Morris, Le Lila Wallace Reader Digest Fund, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Nathan Cummins Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation. Our appreciation for additional funds goes to the Charles Revison Foundation, Time Warner Incorporated. We need to pull the papers of Time Warner's funding apparatus. It's a little foundation. We need to pull their papers because we might end up with some names of some blacks who've been getting some money we didn't know about. We may end up finding some deep shit, Brother Maddox. I already been told there's some jewels up in there. The Commonwealth Fund, the, the New York Community Trust, and you better check your New York Community Trust too because that's the hidden element in controlling the civic side of town, and you better see who they gave money to. Oh, look at that, the Equitable Foundation, the Herkheiser Foundation for Children, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and Miriam and Arnold Frankel put out that Bridges and Boundaries. My point is that Time Warner, Equitable, Philip Morris, because one of the directors is from Philip Morris, all have been in my doorstep before. That's Joan Rosenblum, director of the Jewish Museum, who's thanking all of these people. Jewish Museum, ah, Warner, Equitable, Rockefeller, Ford, all the people we love to knock have all lined up against us before today. So the fact that we've got them now uh, is awful interesting. Now let's look over here. What kind of money Levin got? There's a man named Crawford. Uh, some of the 9%, the second largest block of stock in Time Warner, is owned by Capital Research Company of L.A. Now I called my buddies in L.A. today. They're pulling the paperwork on Capital Research Group. Or what are they, Capital Research Company, because I need to say that right in the tape, because when people hear the tape, they send me the information. 
So what am I saying? Now that we got Time Warner in the focus, let's break down who's up in Time Warner because as we mention their names and the report goes back on what we said, we want a wide array of people to feel pissed off. Uh, and uh, um, Gordon Crawford. Now this is in the story. This is from the story that's out now in the New Yorker that I told you about. Uh, it's called here, let me show you what it's called. It's called uh, The World of Business, Jerry's Deal. Why does Time Warner's Gerald Levin think he can appease Ted Turner, John Malone, Michael Milken? I thought he was a felon. You ain't gonna tell me <laughs> that Time is hanging out with a multi-billion dollar felon right. and won't even hear from a brother who never been arrested in his whole life. All right. All right. Brother Steve. All right. Damn, it could not be that a felon got a better standing than a brother. Damn, so, so that, that trips me out. They got this thing. Maybe this is a devil society. Maybe. 20 years ago, Levin had a very big idea. Last summer, he desperately needed another one. And boy, he got problems now. Anyway, that's the story. And it just talks about some things going on there. We'll get into that a little more. I'm going to write a report up for you and submit it to you. And then in that, the next part of that was where, where is some of this stock ownership? So we go back to this capital research group. And in that earlier profile of time, they, they was in that end too. So we know they're consistently in the Time Warner. Second largest block was finally losing patience. Crawford is, quote, the high priest of media investing. One of his colleagues joked at a recent investment conference, and while Crawford's funds were major stockholders in Time Incorporated before Time Warner, which is just what I just mentioned to you, and Crawford had had a cordial relationship with Levin at Warner Communications, where in 72 his funds became the company's largest investor. He had been family and has been close to Daly and Simmel for years. Crawford told me that particularly after the turmoil in the music division, Crawford's dissatisfaction was matched by that of Levin's largest stockholder, Seagram. Oh, hold it now. World Zionist Congress elects Edgar Brofman. Now this not, yeah, re-elect, this not the same Brofman who wife, chairman of the Urban League Board of Directors, is it? Black wife. Whose black wife, whose black wife is chairman of the Urban League Board of Directors? This could not be the same, Levin, could it? I mean, uh, Brofman, could it? Yes, it is. You know it is. Edgar Brofman Jr. is known to be contemptuous of Levin's performance. Levin refused to give Brofman, Bronfman, Brofman two board seats on Time Warner that he requested. Now, one thing I need to tell you about what Brofman did. On these major campuses, Brother McIntosh, where we fight to have the right to speak, Edgar Brofman gave 40 million dollar donation to the Hillel House, which are the Jewish campus-based organizations who <coughs> harass black professors, black speakers, Jeffries, Tony Martin, Brother Steve, all the as you go, they are there to hate everybody. But Brofman gave them $40 million at the beginning of this school year and told them there better not be one campus that you have not asserted Jewish leadership in or I will rescind an additional donation. Now, here we are, one brother going to Florida A&M two weeks ago, and here's the Hillel House from Florida State over there trying to stop me. I'm down there with $32 in my pocket fighting a $40 million structure. And we whipped them. We whipped them. We whipped them. But you cannot underestimate how much we're fighting, what level of strength they have in the white world to know what it means to finally get somebody front and center. We've been waiting a long time for this level of hunky. Remember we always said the goal was to suck the beast up out of the cave into the light. And like Dracula, the light. Remember it said, remember what the second editorial said? Time Warner sees the light. You're damn right. Because it brought its ass out the cave where it was strong and protected and had to come out here and show itself. And once we got to look at it, we then got to look into it. See, this all, because of this, we got this. And this will lead us into deeper things. 
So what, we got a mason on one side, Henry Luce was a skull and bones, we'll get him in a second. Warner sitting here with a Masonic hat on, with all of Hollywood going to the white Masonic, Masonic tomb. Merge overkill, what happens to debate when big media gets together? Huh. CFR directors, the black directors, pressure, Giuliani, the divisions, Sylvia Roan and Tony Fay, and Big Dick Parsons. Dick Parsons, I have a special message for you tonight. At the Million Man March, we took a pledge never to call a woman a bitch. But you are a bitch, and you're not a woman, so you don't qualify. Because how could your weak man ass go and get these two sisters and tell them two sisters to go down there and tell them other 15 Africans on the little Af uh, Black History Month committee, what kind of weasel of a man are you who stand up and says, when they ask you who did it, you say you. What kind of weasel of a bitch are you? And that's what you are. And, and I hope soon, I'm going to see you. I'm going to get up on you, buddy. God is going to bless me with your presence. God is going to bless me with your presence. And I mean, I had some memorable days. I remember the day Cornell West was talking about me at Howard and didn't know I was standing out front. Them students ran down there and got me. And I went down there and said, you talking against me, brother? Oh, no, 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 brother. No, 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 brother. Oh, no, no, no. I wouldn't do that, brother. I didn't think so. I just come down here just so we going we got some, we going to meet up with this man. Now, 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 let me get some, let me get, let me just go on and do this now real hard, okay? Uh, Eric, uh, I need you to find in my bag your folder. Uh, and the winner is, da -da 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 boy, black people is really awesome, boy. When you, you put the call out about needing something, Boy, black people can show sure find that something you be needing. We say, hey, hey, we need some stuff. What we got here? Let's see who we got. And the winner is, what we got here? The winner is, I just set this up here for a minute while I set something up for you. The profile of the News Corporation of Australia. I'm showing, there, ooh, I'm showing you that as a lead into something. And I think I better just go and get right to them. I don't want y'all to have to go and miss the night and miss the point. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a breakdown of Fox's operation. Fox. Now, what I'm going to bring to you is a certain something I didn't have time to find. <coughs> But I'm telling you now, if you don't never know nothing, I said it last time I was here. Fox is Murdoch and Murdoch is Rothschild. Fox is Murdoch and Murdoch is Rothschild. Now, when the, when the first time Murdoch's name got put towards the Daily Challenge and Rothschild, it got deleted. Right. It made it yesterday or today. And did you notice? Now, you remember what we was talking about? Did you see that story today? <laughs> Just show you that. I told you the boy tried to... The boy tried to get me to speak against Maddox and Sharpton in that interview in the challenge. And I told them right after I did that interview, 2 a.m. in the morning, I called him. I said, but his boy wants to pull us apart. And he asked me that question. And I said, no, they've been straight. But he wrote it anyway on another source. But, but he did it anyway. So he had to do it. It, what it appears as if that he has to sell some divisiveness to the whites to speak a little bit for the blacks. And as a goal, we need a better percentage from the brother. If he's got to go, if he thinks it's 50-50, we need 90-10. So if he's 60-40, next round he got to go 80-20, else his ass going to be in trouble. Because that One Nation piece that ran in the Vibe magazine, that sent divisiveness towards the Nation of Islam post-Million Man March was intolerable. And we know that Khalid was originally interviewed for that story, did not speak against Minister Farrakhan like they wanted, so he got knocked out the story. 
In fact, if you look at the story, his head is cut off in the picture. as Collard's body without a head in it. Called One Nation, question mark, and they end up making a story about Silas Muhammad. That was not the story. Uh, let's see, Murdoch, News Corporation Limited. News Limited of Australia. Now, I'm telling you that the Beers Diamond Mine is the most dominant corporation in Australia. And that the stock of the Beers control the News Corporation of Australia because what you need to know is that when Murdoch showed up, he, he wanted all these things, but he didn't have money. He had to go get financed. When you see how the Rothschild family bankrolled him to the post, bankrolled him to, to build a network, bankrolled him to buy football at a loss, bankrolled him to buy football at a loss was that he wasn't worried about money. He had ultimate backup, and because of that, he could buy everything he could get his hands on, and it was only because Rothschild backed him up. He did the same damn thing for Cecil Rhodes in the late 1800s that let him amalgamate the diamond mines and get control of the land that we're still suffering from today. And I hope Farrakhan don't go and do the Mandela style of leadership. I don't want that. 97% of the wealth is still owned by whites. I don't want that. Yes, yeah, sister. Uh, let's see, Herald Weekly and Times Limited, the South China Morning Post Limited, uh, Anset Transport Industries Limited, News America Publishing Incorporated, Barnes & Noble Books, Murdoch Magazines Division, Good Food Magazine, K3 Magazine, TV Guide, magazine, the Boston Herald, Fox. Now, uh, who bought the Boston Globe? Boy, y'all, I'm scared of y'all. Thank you, uh, Brother Maddox. Uh, New York Times bought the Boston Globe, and I told you that eventually the New York Times and the Washington Post are going to merge into one corporation because now they do the International Tribune together. The Washington Post and the New York Times are going to merge you all. That's going to give them all the dominant papers from the top of Boston down to the Cox family of Atlanta. Now, I'm in Dayton trying to speak at the Black Cultural Festival. The Jewish Federation tries to block me, and the newspaper chairs the Black Festival, and then I look up and see it's the Cox family of Atlanta blocking me in Dayton. And I went right in there and gave that speech anyway, too. So I had experience in being denied. Anyway, Fox Incorporated, Fox Video, Fox, and you know they got the FX channel too. Uh, Fox Broadcasting Company, Fox Television Stations, KDAF, KRIV, KTTV, WFLD, that's Chicago, uh, WFXT, WNYW, WTTG, uh, uh, Fox Video in all kind of countries. 20th Century Fox Films, Harper Collins. Remember, it was Murdoch who went to buy Gendrix for $4,500,000 for a book that ain't even sold 500,000 copies. That means he was being grossly overpaid to push the telecommunication bill, and if we don't look out quick, soon Clinton's going to sign it. He did already? Damn, man, this is worse than I thought. <laughs> New York Post, San Antonio Express. I know a radio man in New York got a radio in San Antonio. That's where Kabila Shabazz is at. Oh, shit. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, the Sun, big in England, Times... Newspaper Limited, Marshall Pickering Holdings, News International, Geographa Limited, New York Post Basic Books, Ballinger Books, Ballinger, Ballinger Publishing, Zondervan. I don't even know what that is. That's microscopes? Bible. Oh, why the devil do the Bible? Now, that's interesting. And all of the Harper Collins. Okay. Uh, uh, he's got a part two up here. Net worth? $10,558,000,000. Million. Million. A night would not pass till he did this, so let's go. <laughs> this is my son, Eric Mohammed. Junior. $10,558,000,000. Is that all? 
that's all they want to report. That's as of January 1st, January 14th of 95. You can see why we don't care nothing about Foxman. And you know how much that hurt Foxman's feelings? He don't get no attention. Let's see here. What we got? Number of non-U.S. affiliates, 16. Number of U.S. affiliates, 32. Number of affiliates, 48. Business holdings, we just went through that. And all other stuff. And down, I'll lift this up. Now let's look at some people who are up in there. Keith Rupert Murdoch, Chief Executive Officer. David Defoe, Chief Financial Officer. James Platt, Public Relations. Investor Relations, William Sorensen. General Counsel, Arthur Suskind, Siskind. Treasurer, Paula Wardinsky. <laughs> Controller, Robert Cannon. Board of Directors, oh yeah, here we go. Murdoch, Keith Rupert, Chisholm Sam, Crowley Edward Kenneth, George Craig, David Defoe, and Altis Urko. Damn. You can see Murdoch ain't got no outsiders on his board. That's because he's controlled by Rothschild. And if you see him walking down the street and he starts to pass, oh, Murdoch, the great escape. And it said this was published by Time Warner Books. Damn. This shit looks like it's all together. He look a little like Shapiro. He ought to be careful. There's a lot of people don't like Shapiro. Information Highway. Look at that Information Highway carefully and look and see if you don't see a pyramid with an all-seeing eye on it. It all kind of goes into the eye. Now, all right? Okay, the new establishment, this is where we're headed. What we're saying here is that a group of white men have come forth to challenge another group of white men. That Murdoch, though he acting like he ain't with Levin, and they acting like they ain't with Turner, and they acting like they got a problem with Brofman, I want you to look at this picture. Here they all are. I'm going to put that back on for you. I'll put this back on. Oh, I'll read it. The new establishment. It's October 94. Okay, let me, let me put this back. This is the cover of Vanity Fair, October 94. Tom Cruise had just done interview with a vampire capitalist. Uh, Vanity Fair, October 94. Tom opens up, and right at the bottom is the promo, the new establishment. Pulled out Haperstam and uh, Annie Leibovitz. Pulled out the gunslingers to smoke these people up and make them look real good. This is the opening. This is the opening. It's October 94, the age of information is upon us, the Cold War. For a past half century, the driving force of the American economy is over, as, the influ as, as is the influence of Cold Warriors. The Gentel East Coast establishment that quietly guided the country through those years. In its place has risen a buccaneering breed of entrepreneurs and visionary men and women from the entertainment, communications, and computer industries whose ambitions and influences have made America one true superpower of the information age. They are the new establishment. So what we're saying is that these whites who look like they're opposing each other, which would be like Chase acting like it wasn't with Chemical and Chase acting like it wasn't with Citibank. <laughs> it's Chase in the house tonight. <laughs> Now, so it says that these whites are emerging together as a powerful elite, and what they did was they did a picture of them sitting together. They meet secretly in Idaho, and here they are in a joint picture, as it appeared in the article and in the L.A. Times. I'm going to show you another copy of this picture, so don't get lost. Here's uh, who we got there. I think that's Warren Buffett of uh, Solomon Brothers, uh, Brath Hathaway. Uh, there's Gerald Levin over there. Uh, no, that's Brofman right there, I'm sorry. There's Gates of Microsoft. There's Summer Redstone. Uh, let's see here. Uh, who we got down that front row? Uh, Murdoch. Where Murdoch? No, where Murdoch is at? Where you at? Man, Murdoch over there. That's Murdoch. There's uh, Turner's main man. 
Uh, there's Murdoch and Brofman together. Now, Murdoch says he's going in the news business to knock out Turner. But why are they at the secret meeting together? Oh, 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 in fact, I got a better, let me do the better picture. Now that you get the picture, let me do the better picture so you can see just how during the year these companies merge closer together than further apart. This will give you a picture of who's who in the picture. Here's one side of the picture. See there, there's Gerald Levin right over there in the corner there. January 95 launches Time Warner Broadcast Network known as WB. I don't know if that's the network got them stupid, silly-ass acting uh, Wayne and Brothers. That buffoon-ass, non-socially redeeming trash of theirs. And in Living Color was on Fox, and in reruns is on FX, which is Fox. Demeaning, remember, demeaning African people is a part of an inner goal. It just ain't about profit. They might make better profit with a better product. They about killing a population. They ain't about stopping me from speech. They want me dead. Dead. And if half of you had been here tonight, hadn't have been here tonight, they might have tried to kill me tonight. Because if you don't appropriately support when you're out on a point like this, death is the answer with no one to ring the bell. I know what happened to Harold Washington. I knew a bunch of people loved him. But when his ass went down, didn't but one of them go chasing for him. And I didn't even benefit from him. Oh, what we got here, agrees to shell out an estimated $4.5 billion for almost 2 million new cable customers coming close with a total of $11.5 million. Now, you know Time Warner owns HBO. HBO. And then think about all that fighting on HBO and all them made-for-TV movies on HBO and all of this and that, all the other stuff on HBO. Def yeah, and they sit up talking all that stuff and they don't want Coakley. But we need to hear from Russell Simmons. We need to talk to Russell Simmons. Any of y'all in here know how to get Russell Simmons? We need to hear from Russell Simmons because the time worn of shit getting ready to come down and every artist, Seal, and uh, Hootie and the Blowfish is time worn of. Hootie and the biggest selling thing out there, Brother and the Hunkies. Probably was a Black History, History Month project. Mu pays off when Congress initiates massive deregulation of the cable industry, giving much-needed goose to Time Warner stock. Warren Buffett, he's the one that rescued Solomon Brothers after they brought too much of federal uh, uh, loan uh, uh, layouts. They overbought the quota. Supposed to only buy up to 40%, they bought 80%. Cornered the market on Treasury notes. The most solvent financial investment in the world is U.S. Treasury notes. You need to know that. Warren Buffett, Multimedia Incorporated, helped broker $19 billion agreement to sell Cap City's ABC to Disney. Watches his stake increase to $2 billion. 5% owner in Gannett. Bill Gates, Microsoft, 20%, sells 20% of Microsoft Network, his embryonic online service. Uh, worth an estimated $125 million to Malone. Now, Bill Gates is tired of being kicked in the ass by Rockefeller. So he took his butt over to NBC and cut a deal to do an all-news station with NBC. GE, RCA, Rockefeller Center, NBC. You got to say them all because they all chase, they all connected. Gates was tied up in antitrust by Rockefeller's government, U.S. Justice Department. So he, and, and, and what Rockefeller does, when you join his shit, he makes you pay a toll. So he sent Bill Gates over to the United Negro College Fund. And the asshole gave the largest single donation in the history of the United Negro College Fund a month ago. And he gave it to who? Bill Gray, Rhodes Scholar, Trilateral Commissioner, and right up the same stroke. Huh? No. We saw earlier Time Warner Viacom on BET. Oh, yeah, that's right. Microsoft just agreed to hook in with BET. Right, they showed their black man. I appreciate you. Right, right, they're doing it now. Microsoft hooked in to give some shit. So what is he doing? Rockefeller says, like he says to Japan, 
If you ain't got no military and I got to pay to free the world for corporate profit and I keep the people dumb, docile, dim with it, and I pay the freight to keep niggas in jail and I pay the freight to kill when it's killing is necessary, then you got to put in the till to rise to the top. So Japan gives 100,000 to Kwesi and Fume and shit. Uh, Mitsubishi Corporation. And, and, and they go out and do all the things Rockefeller say you got to do to be a part of the world order. Summer Redstone. Partnership in it and IT&T Cable Vision Systems. Joins Chris Kraft. Launched United Paramount Network. Broadcast Network. Finally reaches tax-friendly 2.25 billion agreement to sell 1.2 million cable system to Malone. TCI Malone. I know Malone, I know Malone personally from Chicago when they bribed the Chicago Alderman to buy all of the Chicago cable which they now own. And he know I know. And again, he owns, uh, or put 1.5 billion stake in Spelling Entertainment. Michael Orvitz, he's the one who could make or break a company by his creative artist agency. I remember brother Dr. Sims who was uh, with Collett when he was on Donahue's show. And uh, his family got Brother Man Comics. His family got Brother Man Comics. And we... Brother Man as a cartoon, Orbitz gave him a contract worth $40 million, and it had one provision in it. That, it had one provision in it, that creative... What's that down? Creative Artist Agency had sole uh, control of the projection of Brother Man Comics, which meant they lose artistic control. Well, Brother Sims wouldn't do it. While he was up here with Collett on Donahue's show, he had the orange gown on. He took the microphone from Donahue and was explaining anti-Semitism. Right then, right then, he gets home. Two days later, his wife is in the bathtub, dead. Right now, Dr. Sims weighs about 80 pounds. And he's, he's slip, lip is slipping right on off the edge, brother. He's, I believe he's a victim of chemical attack. I know you all know about Zeers Miles, that he's deceased. Zeers Miles is dead. Well, that's another deep thing, too, man. It's some deep shit going on quietly, see, quietly. People are being picked out. So you never want nothing to happen to nobody. But you always got to watch it from the morning to the night because they ain't slick. And Kwame in the hospital. Negotiation with Brofman, the head MCA, take the wrong turn. Orvitz, number two at CAA, Ron Meyer leaves the field MCA. Now Orvitz left that spot to go where? Where's Orvitz at now? At Disney. That's, thank you, Eric. John Malone, TCI. He all up in there, Netscape and all of that connection. Anyway, I'm going to go, I'm going to stick to who we after. I'll get the rest of them later. But let me show you the other side of that picture because there's somebody on the other side of that picture we need to get. And I just want to show him to you. Ho, 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 ho. Okay. Oh, on the air? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, gotcha. Oh, we're getting some deep penetration. Barry Diller. Uh, Diller lost the battle for Paramount. He also bid for CBS. Uh, he's got uh, Silver King. Uh, Eisner, you know, is uh, interlocked uh, at Disney into ABC, Cap Cities. There's Murdoch gets $2 billion infusion for News Corporation from MCI. So when you see Whoopi Goldberg sitting in the center of a circle within a circle, I don't know why I'm here. She's looking, there's a voice and shit. Think about MCI and Murdoch. Announced plans to bring satellite broadcast empire to Latin America. Edgar Brofman sells Seagram's $8.8 billion stake in DuPont before the murder. Acquires 80% of NCA from Matsutsi, Matsuhuti, Huta, Hita, for $5.7 billion. Scott Sasser, that's Ted Turner's man. So here's Murdoch 
saying he's going to beat Turner, and there they are sitting there together at a secret meeting in Idaho. Herb Allen, he set up the secret meeting in Idaho. 1.7 billion sale of Madison Square Garden properties. He the money man for Murdoch, Herbert Allen. That's right, he the, he, the, he the deal man. He's the man that sets up this gathering out there. There's Wayne Husinga. You seen him when they set down uh, the coach down there at the Miami Dolphins. David Griffin and Jeffrey Kotzenberg. Kotzenberg had to get with who he didn't like when his little ABC connection got bought up by Eisner. He fell out with Eisner, but Eisner buys the company, so they had to make up. And, uh... A 10-year deal with Time Warner's Levin worth $600 million. Anyway, I wanted you to see those faces and those people at that meeting. Now, the next year, the second year, they did another story on them. In fact, they put Denzel Washington on the cover of this one. This is October of 95. And this is, in, this is uh, at the bottom. It, now, this is deep. Uh, old boy is on the cover, uh, uh, Tom Cruise, because he's doing an interv interview with a vampire. He's on the cover because he's doing devil in a blue, blue dress. We got a vampire and a devil in new establishment one and two. The new establishment, keeping score, Gates, Murdoch, Eisner, and the other powers who wield influence and billions in the information age. Now in the second year of the story, they profile them from one to 50. Now who, 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 let's see who, let's see, let's see where Levin is. Where is Levin? Da, 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 da. Number six. Come on down. You are the next winner on Let's Get Beat by the Blacks. <laughs> Gerald Levin, Chairman, CEO, Time Warner. He presides over the world's second largest media and entertainment empire. A 16 billion conglomerate that includes the number two cable company in, in viable and viable and viable software assets. The world's largest can't hold a Black History Month music company. The Warner Punkish Music Group, headed by Big Dick Parsons. The Warner Brothers Batman Forever. Oh, Seal, Seal sings the song in Batman Forever. He also is a Warner artist. Plus 25 primetime television shows. The number one paid TV service, home box office, a publishing company and a 24 magazine revenue turbine. Levin's been betting on Big Cable and hopes to become a one-stop shop for all the hopes, all your technology needs. Telephone, faster than a speeding bullet, data transmission, so you can pursue time online and banking and home shopping too. You may not get it, but Levin thinks your six-year-old will. With deregulation on the horizon, he can end up being hailed as a genius. Following the over outsized footsteps of Steve Ross, the quietly doer, I don't even, what did that mean? What's that mean? Okay, the quietly weak Levin is still regarded by some as the accidental chairman. Nervous investors fret that his cable visions are techno-colored pipe dream. And the bloodshed in his music division, you got that right has been splattered all across the headlines. More to come. Also, you got to pick up on this. How, with all this heat in the black community, no New York Times, barely a daily news that's about that big, no TV, no radio. In other words, the whites got together and said, we got to keep a lid on this shit. Murdoch, nobody respects you anyway. You take the point. That's deep, man. And this, every front page of the black papers is pumping the shit strong, brother. And they ain't busting a leak. They, that's deep. That, that, that's, that's, that's an important insight into something about collaboration. Meanwhile, Brofman Jr. stands by with a 15% stake in the company, pondering how to maximize value. Uh, and uh, let's see here. How about Ron Perlman and Jack Welch? Welch is at GE. Perlman is a vulture capitalist. The isolated Levin sits virtually alone in a carnivorous top floor of Time Warner building. His favorite book is The Stranger, The Year Ahead, Down. See, they forecast where you're going to be in a year. 
See, this guy is up. This guy is up. This guy is almost down. So then they give him to us. Now, let's see if we can find this. Oh, this is loaded. All these profiles are excellent. Uh, Spielberg, Geffen, uh, no African. I told you you needed the Forbes 400 richest people. You need the uh, uh, Forbes world billionaires. You need the Fortune world's billionaires. You need the Fortune 500. You need these profiles as small as they are because each of them will lead you to other things. And with that, you will name the names. And for that, you can't speak to black people for Black History Month. Now, let's see if we can find Murdoch. Let's see, is he number 50? Is he number 49? Is he number 30? Is he number 39? Is he number, where's he at? Come on up here, Murdoch, get up here. Murdoch, I said, yeah, I don't even want y'all to miss the cat call. Murdoch, get up here. Who's that got a call, said Sylvia Roan is mad about you. Right, Bob Law got a call from Sylvia Roan about you. Ooh, it was probably just for a minute. <laughs> oh, look at here, Doc, number one. Now, see, that's funny we brought up Bob Law, because it was on Bob Law that I had to stop that trivializing Murdoch as a right-wing fanatic. See, they try to punk Murdoch. They say the post ain't shit. They, the post is deeper than you think. The number one man of the top emerging 50 new establishment is that wild little right-wing fanatical-looking Murdoch. Huh. 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 At 61, Rupert Murdoch is arguably the most powerful private citizen in the world. I'll be damned. And he writes an editorial and not a news story to let you know it's management who don't want the program at Time Warmer, not a reporter. I'm going to repeat that. It goes through the editorial because that's management. And it never showed up as a story. How could you knock somebody out of program and your news division don't even cover it? You're supposed to trumpet that as a success. Most arguably the most powerful private citizen in the world, his global influence is such that the only media baron, William Randolph Hearst, would conceivably say to his underlings, you provide the pictures, I'll provide the war. He owns more than 130 newspapers, 24 magazines, a string of TV stations, a broadcast network, a new cable network, a publishing house, HarperCollins, Fox TV FX, an internet service with MCI, 20th Century Fox TV, and movie studios. And, who, and who's up in the movie studios? The Masons. He has a lock on NFL football in the US, soccer in the UK. He's had his way with the FCC, with Star and Sky TV satellites beaming all across Asia, Europe, and Latin America. The Australian-born media baron communicates with hundreds of millions of people every day. Murdoch's globe trots, summons world leaders, entertains on mountaintop Beverly Hill mansions, once owned by MCA founder Jules Stern. Although he succeeded by Huh? Stein, Stein, Stein. You don't want to forget that. Although he has succeeded by catering to the taste of the working class, the Sun, the New York Post, Fox Married with Children, the Oxford educated Murdoch rarely sees his consumers. He prefers the company of lone rogue proprietors such as John Malone and Michael Milliken. His current obsessions are News and Ted Turner. If he could have one thing in the world, he'd have CNN. I'd be damned. Look at now nah, this shit. Murdoch is jacking up Levin. Levin is buying what Murdoch really wants. But Murdoch, Levin, and CNN are all sitting together in Idaho. I'm confused. The man who controls an empire worth roughly $20 billion disarms opponents at critical meetings with a waspy shabbiness that includes wearing shirts with frayed cuffs and collars the year ahead straight up. He, he more powerful than Bill Gates. He coming in with Windows 95. So now what is that saying? 
I looked a little deeper and found another series of stories. Oh, I want you to refer to this now. The Economist magazine is owned by the Roth Rothschild family. They did a story on me when I was being fired in the mayor's office in 88. But in this article right here about Disney buying, uh, Disney buying ABC, in that story, in the editorial, it says all of this Disney is one thing, but you must remember Murdoch is the man that made it come about. I have watched this Rothschild family promote, pump, and insert their man Murdoch deep inside America. You understand what I'm saying? Now remember that word Hollywood. Remember we talked about that word, that the German word Halle for cave, and the German word Hole for hell is similar, is not without coincidence. That's from the Dictionary of Symbols by J.R. Surlock, Hollywood. And up there on top of Hollywood, you see they got this Pied Piper, up on top of there is Griffin Park, right on the top up there. Notice they got a Pied Piper with some mice. That's the new establishment. Now, now we can see, uh, oh, who's on the board of directors of Time Warner? One of them is Beverly Seals. I picked up your New York Times today. There was a profile of Beverly Seals who heads your lyric opera. But see, you would look at her. I used to work at the Opera House in Chicago and work Beverly Seals concerts. There'd be white people for days lined up to get in there, big time. Now she's head of the lyric opera here. And you would look at her and underestimate what she up to and is she black or anti-black. And right here in the story on Beverly Seals in today's post says that Beverly Seals is not only a director of Time Warner, but as the director of the Human Genome Project, the gene fighting operation that's trying to predispose people by birth with genetic deficiencies. It's a racial thing all the way back to the Harrimans and eugenics and other things. You know what I'm talking about. But you would look at Beverly Seals and wouldn't think of her that way. And that's why even in this story in Murdoch's own, this is the story, brother, in the this is the story that's out now in the New Yorker, CNN, from the right winger Rupert Murdoch. He even calls himself a right winger, trying to belittle himself. At that level of money, you don't have no wings. Look at this story here from your post the other day. Murdoch's news will beat CNN. News uh, Corporation Chairman Murdoch says his global news project will supplant the 24-hour cable news network in the United States by exploiting public distaste for the so-called liberal media elite. Hey, that's just some buzzwords while he using Gendricks, whose wife is the chief business liaison to the Israeli government. I know you know that, don't you? You know that, don't you? You know it now. So now what we've done uh, is we did a little look at the Time Warner connection. We looked them together. We, we, know, we know that Levin is on edge because he's got pressure from other whites. And that's a very good critical moment that we know when we got a white man on the ropes and how to work him when we got him in that position. So we keep up on that. Here are the directors of Time Warner. First director, uh, Gerald Levin, of course. Second director, Big Dick Richard Parsons. Next director, Merv Adelson, Adelson, East West Capital Records Incorporated. Next director is Lawrence Buttonweiser. Oh, 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 hold it now, hold it now, hold it now. Let me do this into the record because I can do it this way. This will work even better. Uh, let's see here. Here we go. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's go back. Uh, what did I just do with uh, Levin? Uh, I just had a sheet with the uh, Time Warner on it. Let me set this up here for you a second. Oh, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where'd he go? It was uh, Time Warner. Uh, Time Warner. Time. Okay, well, I'll write him around 11. Hell, he ain't got nothing. He's lonely anyway, they said. Uh,
East West Records, a capital, that's a division of, uh, of uh, Time Warner. Uh, Lawrence, Lawrence, but Tin, Wiser. I love you, man. <laughs> He's a partner in Rosen, Mann, and Colon. I don't know if they, they, they you know them? <laughs> I ain't gonna mess with you tonight, you know that. Edward Finkelstein. Ed Finkelstein. Ed Finkelstein, he's chairman of Finkelstein Incorporated. Beverly Sills. Uh, Ambassador Carla Hills, I know this lady, she was on the Trilateral Commission. She was Secretary of Housing under Jimmy Carter. She was also head of GAT of the uh, Trade Office. She's uh, Chairman, CEO of Hills and Company, former trade rep. David Kearns, I know this man, D. Kearns. David Kearns is a uh, former chairman of Xerox and trilateral commissioner. Oh, who we got here? Henry Luce the third. Chairman, CEO of Henry Luce Foundation. Reuben Mark. Reuben Mark is a uh, chairman, CEO of Colgate Palmolive Company. Michael, Michael Miles. He's former chairman of Philip Morris. Uh, 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 J. Richard uh, Monroe. Uh, Monroe is uh, CEO, uh, uh, Executive Finance Committee, Time Warner. <laughs> oh, Big Dick lives in Pontico Hills by Rockefeller family. That'd be about right. Uh, Time Warner. Uh, Donald Perkins. Now. The largest grocery store in Chicago, the only one left that Jesse didn't close down with the old boycotts of the 60s. He closed down National, AMP, Red Rooster, DNS, and the only one was left was Jules. Anybody from around Chicago, that's the only grocery store in Chicago, and its chairman is Donald Perkins. He's also on the board of the Ford Foundation. And remember, there are only nine directors on the Ford Foundation, but four of them are directors of AT&T. Just got to keep all of this, y'all excuse me as I play these out of my head. Uh, Raymond Trub, Trub, Raymond T, I can't pronounce white, R-O-U-B-H, Trub. He is a financial consultant of, of the Vicom company. Uh, and then they also got Vincent, Francis Vincent, and he's of uh, Vincent Enterprises. So those are the people who are on the board of Time Warner, and just by mentioning their names and they getting the word, we will advance our level of thinking. Uh, it says here, this is about Beverly Sills in today's New York Times, her outside schedule remains filled. She is a director of Time Warner, American Express. Uh, she's a director of Time Warner, American Express, and the Human Genome Sciences, a genetic engineering company and a member of the board of the Multiple, Multiple Cirrhosis Society and the Hospital for Special Surgery. And her husband is Peter Grinnow, uh, Skyon of the Cleveland Plain Dealer publishing family. Oh, see how they interconnect. Now, I'm in LA and I see a story, and this story is about the new establishment. Uh, it's LA Times, uh, August 30th, 1995, entitled The Fate of a Nation. It's got a nice picture with it, too. Fate of a nation. And uh, I'll just set that up there for the camera on one side before I pull it away. It's got this picture of this man here with nine squares on his chest. And that nine squares is very important. So we just want to get the picture that goes with the story. Don't forget, for those of you who got to leave, the tapes are in the back. I really appreciate your support. Uh, this story is saying that there are three levels of power. Now, remember, we, we saw that story said new establishment versus the old establishment. Well, now what we're looking at is another conflict with the same people described a different sort of way. It broke white people up into three dominant categories, the wired, the klug, and the provincial, are struggling for dominance in America. Only one of them promises high wages and continued growth 
but it does not have a political voice. What does that mean? Murdoch, Microsoft, Eisner, Spielberg, Kotzenberg, strong in their industry, but Rockefeller owned the politicians. You understand what I'm saying? Rockefeller forces NAFTA. Rockefeller forces GATT. So these boys got all this money, but ain't paid no toll to make them no niggas and make them no politicians. So now they want to move in to be the dominant in America, but now they recognize that they have not yet set it up, but they're preparing to. And this is a very fascinating story. I'll read you the date again. It's LA Times, August 20th, 1995, and it breaks down the differences in those networks of whites. And the wired economy, the densely packed concentration of entrepreneurs and companies in America's urbanized states that generate virtually all the nation's globally competitive high-wage industries such as multimedia, design, software, entertainment, computers, biomedical, engineering, finance, and business services. Well, when you do it like that, that's damn near everybody. And then that provincial one is them little right-wing hunkies. It said, then the right-wing hunkies in Utah, Montana, Idaho, and though they really are the working people, they have no vision of a global, therefore they could never be allowed to run America into the global because they're too parochial, they're too white, they're too neighborhood. It's like the difference between commercial banking and savings and loan or investment bankers and savings and loans if you can find one. Anyway, I put that there. Uh, so that you can pick up that there are stories that will reflect those reflections. Now I know it's getting late, and I could have said some things that could have been very rallying, but it was my job to uh, name the names and for me to put in focus uh, those things uh, that were uh, relevant uh, for you. Now, 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 now. Last thing, last couple of things. What is it that we talk about? that makes them want to not let us talk. I mean, I mean, after all, if, it's, if we're really that weak, if we're really that out, outlandish, if we're really that distasteful, uh, such hucklers, why not let a dummy speak if a dummy's only gonna make everyone know how stupid he is? So logically, I should have been allowed quietly to go ahead on and give the speech because, I mean, as I said, I did it at AT&T last year they, 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 they a little bigger than Time Warner. And uh, uh, I, oh, that reminds me. Remember when the New Yorker did this? Oh, Murdoch, what's he going there? Uh, now, y'all with me another second? Y'all got another minute? Okay, I got, a, I got a minute here. I got, now, 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 now. Remember, why or how did Brother Coakley get in trouble with these people anyway? That's something we need to mention real quickly. And we didn't need to do that. We don't need to do this. Uh, let's see here. We don't need to do this. Oh, number one issue on the New World Order set is that white boy that wouldn't wear that UN patch. That's some heavy shit. That's some heavy stuff. Don't lose sight of what's going on in that story, because that's a very significant story. Very, very significant story. Oh yeah, Foxman, while we're on the subject, we didn't forget about that time you all were up for criminal indictment because you all were spying on so-called Americans. And I have up here, Austin, I sent for, I paid uh, $45 or $90, I forget how much it was then, and uh, uh, to the district attorney in San Francisco and got the 900-page file the FBI interviews, the uh, affirmations, the statements, the exhibits that were presented by Dan Roth of the San Francisco Police Department. I brought some of those up here, some of which uh, you would need to review. Thank you, brother. Okay, yeah, I was gonna say where that one come from. Yeah, hey, hey, you know me, yeah, hey. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I wanted you all to uh, pick up on the fact and not forget the fact that uh, 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 this boy, uh, uh, that the boys that were doing the spying, Gerard and the rest of them, uh, had been working for Abraham Foxman, and uh, we want to remember and not let Foxman forget that uh, he has, uh, he's, he's been spying uh, even on Chris Haney, uh, God bless his soul, as he was murdered before he could take over the military of the South African government.
And uh, that was important to us. Now, I ain't gonna do all of them, so don't get scared. I bring more than I need because I never know. I'll be here a few days and stuff, so I got more than enough to share. And uh, you'll tell me how much of it you can stand. Now, what's up? What else is up in there in that Time Warner thing and some of that Boulay connection? Now, I just want to share this with you real quick. We'll talk about it another point. One of the things we did in advancing the Boulay dialogue was to expand the concept of the boule and take it into the concept of the oath takers, the trial of the oath takers. And that each and everywhere we turn, we see that these people took oaths and that their oaths may violate them against the black community. And so the doctors, the lawyers, the medical people, the police, the masons, the, this is a shield of the Omega, skull and bones, and that's the boule logo there. We're moving in on smashing at the oath takers. But what I need to tell you is we just stole, I mean acquired, the brand new 1995 Boulé History Book Part 2 written by a man in New York named Hobart Jarrett. How many of you all in here know Hobart Jarrett? Nobody. Hobart Jarrett is Professor Emeritus at City Colleges of New York. Hobart, he's the historian for the Boulay. Charles Wesley wrote the Boulay History Part 1. And in fact, here's the cover. Here's the cover of Wesley. Here's the cover of Wesley's book uh, on behalf of the Boulay. And there's the Boulay History Book Cover Part 2. Now, uh, this is a very profound development because in our investigation of what it is they do and what it is they don't do, Look over there in the corner carefully at the Boulay logo, which you see over in the corner. And the Boulay logo is a animal looking thing uh, with uh, a right paw over an urn. And inside the urn is a circle within a circle. Well, that's secret society I always talk about, about Rose and Rothschild, and how it was denoted by Quigley, professor of... Uh, Harvard, Princeton, and Yale, that that circle within a circle is a secret society. But lo and behold, in the Boulay History Book Part 2, and I'm going to say this fast, it's Boulay tapes in the back. We'll talk about it at another moment. Remember that they never showed us what was between sigma, something, pi, something, phi, and we found out it was nine squares and nine squares, and that those are the nine chambers of the Kabbalah. And then I go to New Haven, and I'm telling them about the Boulay and the nine squares, and my man George jumps up out the audience. I now know him as George. He said, man, Steve, New Haven is the city of the nine squares. New Haven is the city of the nine squares. The boule is set up on the tenets of skull and bones at Yale. Yale is in New Haven. Huh. Must be some connection there somewhere. Anyway, uh, part of what they're scared of is, remember, we went up in there at that Boulay convention. That's where Rockefeller was up in the Ritz-Carlton in the Pentagon City in September of 93. We went up in there. But in the Boulay History Book Part 2, I just want to show you this. This is very important. I'm going to move on. What We finally got an explanation of what the urn was. It says right in here, this is real deep, the urn in the pen guarded by the paw of the Sphinx represents the container into which were placed the names of Greek citizens who would be chosen by lot to lead the state. And where is the right paw? The urn in the pen guarded by the paw. So what does that mean, Africans? The boule, those 3,500 men that we talk about all the time as being the talented 10th, have now told us that the naming of the names is in the urn. But they've taken a sworn oath never to name those names. And now we got the proof. Huh. And in another picture, see, they don't always show what's always in there. See, there the urn is empty. Remember the other picture, the urn had the circle within a circle in it. Even here, they almost make nine squares, but not quite. 
If you take that line over one more inch, you got nine squares. Somebody muddied that back up. That's the closest they ever come to showing all them nine squares. And the center of the nine squares, the center square, is the ninth square. And the reason I bring that up is this. In the Alpha Phi Alpha history book, now, oh, oh, you see, you see that it says that the founders of Sigma Pi Phi, uh, the pen is modeled after the Grecian Sphinx. Now, that's interesting that they mentioned the Sphinx at Thebes, because when I looked up the Sphinx at Thebes, uh, when I looked up the Sphinx at Thebes, it says uh, it is guarding the meaning of something that is to remain beyond the understanding of man. That's deep. Then I looked up the word devil in the Dictionary of Symbols, Brother Maddox, and the shit says, like the Greek Sphinx. You see, we just looked at the Grecian Sphinx. Now we look up, and in a definition of devil, it says, like the Greek Sphinx. Now that is deep. And you might not understand it yet, but you'll get to that. And here is the definition of that Sphinx at Thebes from the same dictionary of symbols. The Sphinx at Thebes, at the head and breast of a woman, the body of a bull or a dog, the claws of a lion, the tail of a dragon, the wings of a bird, being the supreme embodiment of the enigma, the Sphinx keeps watch over an ultimate meeting which must remain forever beyond the understanding of man. That's the Sphinx at Thebes, the white Sphinx. And that's important, again, because then we go over and see that in talking about the devil, like the Greek Sphinx, it incorporates the four elements. Its back legs correspond to the earth and to the spirits of the netherworld. The green scales on the flank allude to water and undines and dissolution and the blue wings to, I don't know what that is, and also to bats because wings are membranous, membranous, membrane, you know what I'm saying. The aim of the devil is regression or stagnation, which is fragmentary, inferior, diverse, and discontinuous. Finally, this tarot mystery card is related to the instincts and to desire and all passionate forms, the magic arts, disorder, and perversion. Anyway, mm, that's interesting. Now, let, let, me, let, me, let me share this with you. This is another edition. In this magazine here, Biblical Archaeological Review, July, August 95. We now finally have a original comedic picture of that Grecian Sphinx. Not the Greek one, but the Kemet one. They made it Greek. We found it Kemet. So that means that these men could have been African. They could have gone African, but they chose to go Greek. And that's important. And in here, in this story, it says that the Greeks are the first philosophers. And as we always laugh, but in it it says the Greeks are the first philosophers because in Kemet, the Kemet people, God was all-knowing, all-present. They lived God concretely. In Greece, we knew God not. Therefore, we philosophized about God we never met. And that did make them the first philosophers in their own admission. Now, one last thing, and I'll let you go. I know some of you all got to catch trains and stuff. Uh, uh, little skull and bones real quick. Yeah, and uh, this go back to, uh, this go back to, uh, um, uh, oh boy, um, loose in them. Oh, this is a big Jewish file. We'll have to save this for another day. We'll have to save that. I'll be around a while, so if y'all call me out to dugout. Yeah, and don't forget to come tomorrow because we got to make some decision about where we going on Thursday. Right. Interesting. Uh, 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 so we got to be prepared for that, and you all got to stick with us because uh, any moment you might turn your head, uh, we might be out of here. So you got to be careful not to let anybody slip in the chain right here late in the last moments. Now, one thing real quick, we know what, what always whites are always worrying about is public order. Uh, that's why we have stupid stories all the time on TV and everything. Oh, real quick. I want you all to look at any ad in the newspaper. In fact, on page two of today's New York Times is an ad. Every ad for a watch, I guarantee you the time will say 1010. 
I was going to look at today's uh, second page of New York Times, Saks Fifth Avenue, watch it's got 1010. Everywhere you look, even the digital say 1010. I just want you to look at that. And by the way, Foxman, uh, since there's James Edward Best laying on the floor in a straight tie, and all the descriptions of the killer had him in a white shirt and a bow tie, we remember the ADL's role in, yeah, I need that one. We know ADL's role in the assassination of Temple Brother Khalid, Brother Fox-ass man. <coughs> and Bess ain't gone to trial, though he shot Khalid 18 days before O.J. went to jail. O.J. was in jail 464 days, been out two months. Bess ain't even been to trial yet. And in this report right here, Foxman tried to uh, beat up our man here, Brother Eric, but he also tried to insinuate that uh, this man, Brock, William Brock, who was with Best the weekend of the shooting, was with Best the weekend before the shooting in uh, Seattle, Portland, Tacoma area. Uh, Brock uh, fronts for the spotlight people uh, over there in D.C. Uh, and Brock uh, is getting away from us now. Boy, that's you two for zero on block. Brock. Uh, we have a, hey, look in there. He's in there. Come on now. He's in there. Come on, Brother Eric. Let's cheer on Eric to find Brock. Come on, Eric. We had Brock down for some big questions, and Eric, he didn't do too well. We had Brock, we was going to ask him them key questions about the assassination and stuff. And uh, 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 Eric had the responsibility of asking him them deep questions to, to uh, find out what he was up to. And uh, he kept saying, Steve Coakley said, Steve Coakley said, Steve Coakley said, and then Brock never answered the question because he was too busy fighting Steve Coakley. Anyway, in that report, the ADL say Brock is one of Collett's loyal associates. The only problem is I know Brock hated Collett, was with Best the weekend before the shooting, and so what the ADL tried to do in this report was to put the shooter's people with the victim. And Foxman, we ain't forgot you for that, so don't think you're getting away, and uh, we got our eyes on you uh, right up here. Uh, Brother Coakley, you remember Brother Coakley started talking about the Trilateral Commission. That was one of our early things. This is uh, uh, them at the Trilog, one of their old meetings. Uh, we started off messing with them. Uh, we talked about their crisis of democracy and how it impacted on black people. Uh, we then uh, 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 looked uh, at Trilateral Commission's address right here in New York. We might, it's right up over the ADL's office in the UN Plaza. Oh, yeah, we get the address and the phone number. They in Suite 711. And remember, in the crisis of democracy position paper, it said if New York is able to offer reduced social services without disorder, it can prove it can be done in the most difficult environments in the nation. If New York will offer reduced social services, New York, you all were a test case for what started in 75, which the country is under control over now to take over the American cities by the bankers. In D.C., they put that financial control board on Barry and took away his power. But they practiced it in New York. So we know New York can't take no more studying because the country can't suffer like they have when the shit works in New York. Rockefeller's agenda using the term for North and South America that was coined over 400 years ago, Rockefeller would call it the Congress of the New World. Say he's going to merge U.S., Canada, and Latin America into one unit. Oh, this is uh, Forbes of October 30th of 89. The story is entitled the Rockefeller Congress. And the point of it is, is that uh, Rockefeller has instigated in the American society the end of sovereignty, the end of sovereignty, the end of sovereignty is one world order. The end of sovereignty, the end of sovereignty is a dangerous possibility because they know, like Brzezinski said for them, in the end of sovereignty, the only problem is to make sure the people don't get out of control. That's all they worry about, public order. They don't need to be correct, they just have to be. Henry Luce at Skull and Bones, for more than a century and a half, Skull and Bones, whose initiates include Henry R. Luce, that's the founder of Time, Potter Stewart, Supreme Court Justice Bush, 
been the most powerful secret society in the nation. My only point is to show H.R. Luce and the symbol of the brotherhood of death. The brotherhood of death. And remember, they call that the order, and the order has dominated and infiltrated all aspects of the American society. And that was important to us because, remember, it was on page 28 of the Boulay history book that the Boulay founder, Henry Minton, wanted to create an organization that would partake, in his own words, of the tenets of Skull and Bones at Yale. And remember, Yale is in New Haven, and New Haven is the city of the nine squares. And that is kind of ironic, because I got some tapes out there on the Million Man March, Satanism, Washington, D.C., and Freemasonry. And you should want to get those tapes. And then we're looking for this symbol of the devil called the, uh, the Goat of Mendes. And the Goat of Mendes is symbolic of the Day of Atonement, where goats are sacrificed up to atone for one's sins. Collard is a Capricorn. Capricorns are goats. It says in the dictionary of symbols around a diamond, it says the only way you can soften up a diamond is to pour on it the blood of a hot goat. And I suggest to you that the permits for the Million Man March would have never been signed if Collard had not been sacrificed. And you saved his life right here in this room. That's all that's been happening around here. You're saving my life tonight. We ought to call this uh, uh, Life Incorporated or some shit. <laughs> Say, hey, now we really know. <laughs> yeah, we got the idea. You know, this is uh, New York Times on the bones. And uh, we know they up in High Street in New Haven. The tomb George Bush came from. Why would black men want to be like that? But this is the key thing I want to show you right here. Is where did the university, where did Skull and Bones come from? Skull and Bones came from a charter that they got from the University of Ingolstadt in Germany. You see that? Is that true? That's, well, let's just say, let's just say it says that in that book there, right? We don't want to say it's true. Let's just say it says that in the book. Now, let me show you something that was in the history book of Alpha Phi Alpha. Huh? Yep. Uh, in the history of Alpha Phi Alpha, right in the, right in the, uh, right in the introduction, or strike, yeah, introduction, page 18. Uh, now, notice it says that Skull and Bones, the Illuminati had its origin at the University of Ingolstadt and recruited mainly from student groups. Blah, blah, blah. The, uh, blah, blah, blah. These had come, both coming to German universities, German. So we're saying that Skull and Bones got its charter from Germany. Notice that the, the everybody talk about the Illuminati. You see the day it was started, right? May 1st, May Day. And that's the day they started attacking me in Chicago in the mayor's office. I hit the papers May 1st. And that's because I fight them and they come to me on their holiday. I understand it. That's right. That's right. That's a satanic holiday. The order has its origin in Yale in 1833, but Skull and Bones is a chapter of a German secret society. You see that? Now let's go over to the Alpha Phi Alpha history book, page 18, and they say, where did Greek letter societies come from? This is written by Charles Wesley, who wrote the history book of the Boule. The organization of Greek a letter fraternity among Negro college men has been an inevitable result of the development of college life in America. College fraternities have been uh, the special developments of college life and university life in the United States and Canada. Relationships may be noted with fraternal organizations and convocations of the Middle Ages. That's King Arthur and the Round Table Middle Ages and with corps of German universities in the modern period. What does that suggest? They're suggesting that the modern fraternity came from the Middle Ages and Germany. We know Skull and Bones came from Germany with a charter from Ingolstadt. So the suggestion is that the blacks recognize that they're an offshoot of the damn round table and Skull and Bones, and they operate as such. And even the first fraternity in America, a white one, Phi Beta Kappa, was originally, in fact, I think this is where our man Comrade, ain't he at William and Mary tonight? Isn't that where ain't he at William and Mary tonight? Somewhere. Somewhere with William and somebody, right? <laughs> 
It started as a social club by five students and later adopted a secret character. It was a Masonic organization, and then it became an uh, honor society after the anti-Masonic agitation of 86 beat them back into an honor society and made them get up off of that front masonry. And look right there, there's the page number 18, or 1 and 8 is 9, and that's what we have, a boule, four male and four female Greek letter societies. So I just wanted to add that into the record. You might not have time to translate it, but I needed to add it in the record because this will allow us to uh, talk at another time. You'll study these things later. I'm just doing this for the record. There's the Boule logo again. We looked at the nine squares. We found out that those nine squares were the nine chambers of the Kabbalah and that those nine squares all added up to the number 15 every which way it went. Every which way you go, that adds up to 15. And if I was to go back here and put that thing back up there that said devil, you will see it said that the devil was the 15th card in the tarot deck. Anyway, I'm suggesting to you that part of what gets us in some of our deepest trouble lately is that we took the same things we always looked at and found out it was satanic. Again, just to refresh those, and that's the so-called uh, cannot utter name of God, tetragrammation, dealing with the number 72 and other things. A person who's a mason or in the societies will never talk about this, but the point of it is that we found that the Jewish mystery people uh, in the early, early centuries uh, manipulated things they didn't understand and told people you couldn't say this name. So since they weren't of the God, they banned people from saying the name of God, and in all the secret societies, you cannot say the name of God. And remember this just for the record. That's the Boule Journal. Boule is advisors to the king. That's Wesley who wrote the history book. Wesley who wrote that alpha book. Wesley's being memorialized when he died in 87. And in Wesley's memorialization was that dialogue where we see on one side Alfred Lord Tennyson, talking about the fair order of the table round, and on the other side we see Wesley talking about the round table, and we know that the round table was the word that Professor Quigley gave for those people who were extensions of the secret society between Rhodes and Rothschild. And that book I showed you, um, uh, well, we don't go into that. Anyway, we'll kill all that part for right now. We won't need it. Our last thing I want to say, this right here, last thing. I go to New Haven, Connecticut. I told you they the city of the nine squares. Uh, uh, we gave this lecture. And this tape is in the back. We gave this lecture in D.C., myself and a brother Hamza. And uh, that's the flyer from the lecture. And uh, we're looking at this thing here, Gold of Mendes. It's very interesting. Washington Post did a story called, uh, called a Satan from Satan to the Sphinx. In fact, I did the front of that in transparency. Uh, and... Uh, might not get it up on the screen. And what it, anyway, what it highlighted, the fact that this symbol here uh, is uh, something to do with the devil. That, in fact, if you look on Comet, you're going to see that same symbol on the Comet. Uh, and uh, that's the satanic goat of Mendez, uh, the god of lust. And what is interesting about that is the Post did a story, Washington Post did a story, and the story was called From Satan to the Sphinx, and it said, it started trying to take Minister Farrakhan's speech, and it laid out the Capitol. There's a million men were laying out here. This is the Capitol building where the stage was right there, and the million, two million men were this way. Here's the layout of D.C., White House, Washington Monument. That's the Eclipse area, the White House, uh, Jefferson Memorial, Washington Circle, DuPont Circle, House of the Mother Supreme. That's where Albert Pike is buried. They then said that Farrakhan's speech was... Uh, talking about the uh, gold of Mendes and suggested that the gold of Mendes was right up here. And right earlier in the same article, they ran a map, they ran a map from the Million Man March study guide uh, showing a layout of D.C. But as you can see, or what you don't know about this map is that north is facing up. Every time somebody shows you a map, north must face up. But notice to make the lie in this story, they put a map out and put north going sideways. You see that? And tried to suggest that the goat of Mendes was over here, that this was over there. In fact, if you take that goat of Mendes, which is supposed to be the devil, and turn it back over and think about Spielberg and pull this part of it up, you see the man Yoda, the little animal in the Star Wars who advised him on the, how to deal with the dark side. You see it? 
All right? Don't tell nobody I told you and shit. This is why they want to kill me now, because I'm all up into that devil. This is Spielberg, George Lucas, Hollywood, Kotzenbach, Eisner, Disney, Levin, Geffen. Yeah, and we headed your way. And we coming with the pitchfork. Two fingers to you. So then, to try to say that the gold of Mendes was right here, put north that way, but if you turn north the way it's supposed to go and turn the damn thing that way, you see they tried to hide the gold of Mendes was over there. You see what they did? They tried to say in the story the gold was there, but put north to do that, you had to mislay a map. So you see, that's the caption that ran under it. The Devil in Downtown Washington adopted from Freemason Tree Satan's Door to America, published by Freedom Masons Ministry. But the goat is over there. That's the goat of Mendes right there. And they tried to hide it. So then we go to New Haven, Connecticut, the city of the nine squares. Now, we get up there. We got all this on film. Right up there in the nine squares is the Knights of Columbus headquarters. Right in the center of the ninth square, that yellow square is considered the ninth square. So now we got the Knights of Columbus founded in New Haven in 80, 1882 and how it's a secret society, a supreme council, all the things the Masons got. And as you follow the yellow brick roads, Cecil Roads, up to the ninth square. Okay? Now that's in New Haven in the ninth square. In fact, they even had a real estate company. It's called the Residence at the ninth square with nine squares. And at the top of that building carved right into the top, are nine squares. I go to Morehouse, I'm telling about the nine squares. We're in the King Chapel. Right up on the wall was nine squares carved into the wall. Right up on that wall were nine squares carved into the wall. It must have all been an accident. Then we get to the center of the center of New Haven. In the center of New Haven, they have what they call the center church. And in the bottom of the center church, uh, uh, Alton is a graveyard. They got uh, graves underneath the church. In fact, when they went down there, they thought they had maybe 100. They looked down and found out, they thought it was 137, found out the white people was buried on top of each other, and 1,700 people was buried in the basement of the church. You can go down there. We went down there, got it on film with them damn headstones all in the bottom of the church. It was a graveyard. When we got to the ninth square, we found a graveyard, the Brotherhood of Death. But check this out. And I'm going to end right here, just so you know where we at that they didn't want us to get to. Here's the brochure acknowledging the, acknowledging the uh, New Haven, Greater New Haven. We're looking at what they call the green or the center. This is the center of the ninth square. And in that you see a diamond. But on top of that diamond you see the gold of Mendes. You see it? Do you see it? You see them ears? You see that coming down? You see that angle coming across there? They had a gold of Mendes right across there, and right in the center of the diamond is a point. D.C. D.C. is a city that's made in the form of a diamond. So we go to D.C. for the Million Man March, and there we make an approach to the diamond. We suggest that the diamond got something to do with the devil. And in fact, in the Wizard of Oz, I always told you all, we want to get to the bottom of the Wizard of Oz. Just my proof, May Day, first day, May Day. Interestingly enough, I recently heard from Michael Jackson say he had a dream, say he's supposed to put Coakley's words into writing and sing them all over the world. I look back in 88, there I am on the front page with Michael Jackson on the side and SOS in the corner. But they come for me on their holiday, and we ain't been nothing but wrestling since. I think we're getting close. Because since that time, we only got closer. Okay? Okay, so now, so now, so now, you look down the street from there, and of course, right in the center of New Haven, oh, you can't see that well enough, right down the street from there, of course, is Yale University, but this is the one sheet I had to show you, and the show you was that D.C. is laid out in a diamond. As soon as I did this in a lecture, they did a story about the 40 stones that lay around D.C., and I told everybody, you come to D.C.,